Thank you very much, and welcome back to Tampa City Council. Roll call, please. Carlson, Bursak, here. Clendenin, Henderson, present. Vieira, here. Miranda, here. and Maniscalco. Here. We have a fiscal form. Thank you very much. We've heard from the public today, uh, and now we have the Chief of Police uh, to present. Yes, sir. I, I did finish my presentation, so I was just available for questions. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I, I yield to uh, Councilwoman Henderson, who had requested to speak first. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Chief Burko, how you doing? Good. You know, well, I want to say morning, but it's afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you about is in um, response to youth and curfews. Tell me what happens if a youth is out after curfew. What happens? Is it a civil violation? Based on the um, proposed ordinance mm -hmm. in front of you, it's my understanding it's a civil violation. The first is a written warning, and then the second would be a $50 fine. Okay. A written warning and a 50. Are they required to leave the area? It's, it's all about safety. It's connecting the youth back with their family. Okay. And the last thing we want is, is, is anybody to be a victim of a crime, especially a crime of this magnitude. So it's connecting the youth back with their family. So a warning, a $50 fine. You say connecting the youth back to their family. Well, Are they required part to call the, their parents? Part of it is yes. Is, okay. is, meeting, is joining them back up and putting them back in a safe environment. Okay. So whether it's a parent or a legal custodian or aware of, it's laid out really well in, in the ordinance. So would they be required to sit in a police car and wait for parents? It would be, it would be a police station okay. or, or somewhere else of that, somewhere safe. Because that's our manpower um, that's taken off the street when we're dealing with youth if they have this particular infraction. So I just wanted um, to make sure that I understand that in regards to the particular ordinance um, should we decide to go with the curfew. Are teenagers really the problem when it comes to Ybor City streets being when it's closed down at 3 o'clock? Well, no 14-year-old no should be out after midnight in, in any area at all, and, and especially an area like that. But um, it's, it's a bigger problem than just teenagers. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's um, you know, what I'm hearing from the community as well. I think um, at this point, I really, you know, we've heard a lot of public comment, which I really appreciate, by the way. Uh, the information that I put out to the media was very important. I want to thank Attorney Zellman as well, because a proposal is just that. It's a proposal. It doesn't have to be my way, Gwen Henderson's way, because I presented it as the councilwoman for District 5, which I care about and it is where I live. What's important is, especially today, in light of what's happened, is the dialogue. Had I not proposed it, I don't know if we would have seen all the citizens that care about Ybor City, that have proven their resiliency, what they care about in terms of the economic vibrancy of Ybor City, and it continuing, people keeping their jobs, and feeling safe. That was revealed today because something was proposed. But I've heard from the community. There's several people involved in that. There are the people who own buildings, and there are people who lease buildings. So there's an investment here that a lot of people care about, and we also have a growing residential population. So we cannot avoid talking about this, and the proposal opened up the dialogue today. What I did hear is that our community is very resilient. And so our business owners um, do care about their positions on 7th Avenue and in our historic district, which has entertainment. I just want to be clear about that because it is a historic district. That's important. I am a person that operates from the standpoint of being real grown, 59 years old. But I put myself in the shoes of young people who like being out. I put myself in the shoes of just a parent who has young people out in the street. We have to do something. And so that's what's important here today. We have this dialogue going. And just for a matter of clarification, I you know, do believe in free enterprise. It's not a means of punishing businesses. That's not what today's conversation is about. The goal ultimately is to eradicate an environment that promotes violence in the late night hour and to ensure that to ensure that Ebor or continues to thrive because we're not the only people paying attention we have 
the global society, people who come, who travel to this town that care about their safety and how they're going to navigate this wonderful and historical special place called Ebor. We have 30,000 black men that will descend here next summer, Omega Sapphire Fraternity Incorporated. Their grand basilisk had, has to know that he is bringing his men into a safe environment because guess what? They're going to be just like Cap Alpha Psi. They're going to hang out on 7th Avenue. And to see it, to witness it myself, for them to descend on our city like that was a beautiful experience. I experienced it, them being here loving Ebor just the way that we do. So the larger narrative is if we don't have this conversation, then the world doesn't hear it. They heard you all push back on, no, we don't need to shut down at 1 a.m. I heard you say that, and I can support that. But there are some things that need to change. The other thing I want to ask you about is the situation where 7th Avenue is closed off. You know, they congregate. And I, I think about it in terms of, you know, in college, the set, that's where we hang out. It's fun. I can see young people like, liking to do that, just being in the street, not ready to go home. And so we close it off, but that you know, eliminates the traffic from going through. There are business owners who don't like that you know, when the bar is shut down. Now, oh, and I want to say this while it's on my mind, because I don't want to forget, because I'm you know, in my 50s. But you know, when the bar closes at 3 o'clock, what does happen is the bars close their doors. They're done with you. They're done with this population. You've paid for your drinks. You've done what you had to do. We've gotten your money from you. Now it's time for you to leave our establishment. So now it's left up to, you know, the police officers. I heard people today accusing the police officers of not doing their job. These are thousands of people out in the street that will let go at one time. So I just want to hear what you have to say about the street closure. Is it still a good idea to do that? Should we open up 7th Avenue? No, it's a great point, and, and I like what you said before. The police department can't handle this problem on its own. This is a community problem, mm -hmm. and everybody coming together, and that's where things, real change happens. If everybody wants to look at just the police department to solve the problems, we're not going to get past that hurdle. That's where big change comes, the stakeholders, the citizens, the businesses. So getting the feedback from the community is, is crucial. And I'll tell you, that's the million-dollar question, to close the road or not to close the road. And, and, I'll, and I've been doing this for quite some time. And I'll tell you right now, up front, I'm a huge proponent of that road being staying open as late as possible. In this role, one of the first things I did is extend that to the latest possible time when that road is closed. The main reason for it being closed is before the clubs let out, so when thousands of people, especially on that one block that we're talking about, the 1600 block of 7th Avenue, come out, there's a place for them to come out because those sidewalks cannot handle it. So we have to have a place available for them to come out so they're not walking out into traffic. So extending that road closure time was one of the first things I did is extend it to later in the night. And that's an on-call time of when that happens. Some clubs start to let out a little bit sooner than others. So the ship commander out there, out there makes that determination. And anywhere, that's usually anywhere around 2 o'clock or 2.15, depending on when the clubs start to let out. Okay, so you would like to keep the roads closed. Well, again, I would like to keep them open as long as possible. Okay. And, and then, then when, when we need room for the clubs to let out mm -hmm. where the pedestrians mm -hmm. could go for their safety. Okay. Um, there was something else I had in my notes to ask you. Okay. So uh, abatement period. That is, I don't think legally we can do that. Um, but... What is a recommendation outside of just how you handle the streets that you have that gives us a legal avenue for public safety besides the streets, um, the street closure and opening in and out of the right time, if I'm sure. saying that correctly? Absolutely. Let me use the Elmo here. So you can see here, this is uh, Ybor City and this is violent crimes, and you can see between the hours of Midnight and 4 a.m., violent crime is literally doubled during those times. Those are our, our peak times of violent crime. And then on the next one is our disturbance calls that are in Ybor City. And you can see the disturbance calls are actually on a downward trend. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, moving into 23. And the yellow is the disturbance calls between midnight and 4 a.m. And the blue is the disturbance calls between 8 p.m. and midnight. And you can see, despite the downward trend over the last three years, that they literally almost double after midnight. So it's clear that the problem is from midnight to 4 a.m. And that's where the, uh, the crime is occurring, the disturbance calls are occurring. And you made a comment before about the, the police department and the proactivity. And I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm proud of the officers, like Councilman Carlson said before, the courage that they have in running into the face of danger. And like I told you before, I just came from memorial service where an officer was killed in the line of duty. There's nothing in, I can be more proud of is, is our officer's response. And their self-initiated activity in Ebor is nearly 5,000 calls, nearly 700 traffic stops, approximately 250 arrests, and our foot patrol is up nearly 86% in Ebor from this time last year. So the officers are out there working, and they're doing a great job. Something like this, this wasn't brewing. This wasn't a situation right. that brewed. This is something that literally sparked up in seconds and turn to gunfire. So um, looking at avenues of how we can solve this, and, and that's why I like looking at the Orlando model, and it's not a decision we're gonna be able to make today, but evaluating everything out there and what works and what works in Tampa and what would work with our, with our legal area. But the Orlando model is very promising. I spoke to the chief on the phone about it several times, and uh, that was their same issue, it was between 12 and, and four over there. And uh, I think dissecting and analyzing their plan is the, is the first step. Understood. Okay, um, two more things. I, I learned from an officer when we had the horses, um, 10 people let out Ebor, 10, 10 officers, and now we're up to 50. That's a lot of human capital um, that we invest in that particular part of town. Do you see a need for there being more? So I, at that point in time, I believe that we had the right amount of officers. Mm -hmm. However... However, I understand the fear of crime. I understand what happened, and that's why we're increasing patrols. Okay. Now, the last thing is kind of interesting to me. It's really not even about the club activity. It is um, people creating their own parties. They don't need to be, they don't lease space to do this. They create their own situations, like having parties in parking lots and, you know, gathering mm -hmm. in spaces um, that don't require permits. What do you see in terms of that being an issue? How are we going to address that? They are not patronizing these businesses. No, correct. There, there's actually an ordinance that they're, they're looking at now, the legal team, about those parking lots mm -hmm. and the requirement of either having security or just a parking lot attendant. And I'm a proponent for having an investment in your own property and, again, not looking at police department to be the sole solution, and whether it's private security, whether it's other teams all coming together. So I'm a proponent for security in private parking lots. Okay. I'm, I'm glad you said it. I mean, I know that because we have addressed it on council, but I'm asking you a question. <coughs> Even though we know the answer up here, the public still needs to hear it because maybe they weren't listening when that was brought up before, so that, that how we're addressing that. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'll defer back to the chair. Thank you so I much. Council Member Carlson's hand up. Go ahead, sir. I have a lot of um, questions. Um, the um, can you tell us what the do you for the the person who was caught? Do you have any idea what the motive was or or how the incident actually happened? I saw the videos, and and but do we know anything about? Um, some people said in in public comment that groups came in intentionally to meet each other there. Is that what happened, or do you have any idea how it, how this incident actually happened? There, and, and you made a comment before, there's, there's a lot that I wish I could share with you about this case, but our detectives are doing a lot of work. And if I say something that's part of an ongoing investigation, it could compromise their ability to make those other two additional arrests. So when that case is closed, I'll be happy to come back and discuss that with you. Um, the, also, there's an allegation about these being gangs. Again, part of the ongoing investigation. So I, I would just say to my colleagues, without knowing the answers to those two questions, we don't. Well, there's no possible way we can come up with a, a policy. So that's not a criticism of TPD, and I understand you need to be 
um, uh, you can't talk about ongoing investigations, but those are two really important questions that we need to know uh, to be able to come up with it. Because if we're, if we're diagnosing it, we put a blanket rule on all of Ybor City and all bars and everything, but we don't even know why exactly this happened. Do you, can you say, or do you know well, whether- I can, I can tell you what we do know. We do know it was a fight that erupted in literally seconds that turned to gunfire. In, in the middle, I mean, literally seconds this erupted and seconds later this happened. Um, do you know, um, do you have any idea if the people were drunk or on drugs? That was another allegation of the, of the community. It, Again, those, those things take time. And that's another thing that I think we would need to know. Um, if they were, it's one thing if they're underage people, it's another thing if they were, if they were drinking, um, it's, another, it's another thing if they were on drugs. Um, do you, uh, I've heard through the grapevine that they did not go in any bars. They just came and hung out on the street. Do, can we confirm that they didn't go in any bars? You know, I wish I could answer every single one here, and trust me, I really do. But any question that I give about an ongoing investigation that could compromise it, and that's I th all. I think that's, but that is, that is one of the most important questions because in, if, if they didn't go in any bars, then it is about the outdoor culture that, that um, my colleague was talking about a minute ago, and, um, and that Ebor is seen as a gathering place for people after wherever else they've been. And so that's another key question. If they didn't go into bars, then how can we blame the bars? Because the bars didn't attract them, the street attracted them, and we need to understand that. Um, I heard again through the grapevine that 7th Avenue was shut down at 11.30 that night. Um, can you confirm what time it was shut down and why? So again, like I said before, it's based on the shift commander and dynamics of the bars letting out. Uh, one thing that they do, um, depending on the traffic, is they do close one lane earlier to allow emergency vehicles to get in. So that may have been at that time. Um, I mean, it, it, further to what my colleague said, is it possible to make it 2.30 to 3 or 3 to 3.30? Um, I, I, I've heard again through the, I have, I had to, no to me, the, you, right here, the latest that we can keep that road open, I am a huge proponent for, but it's depending on the dynamics of the situation. Some clubs don't wait till three o'clock to start letting people out. You, you know, I, I, I've been to Broadway shows and other things in places like New York and London, and thousands of people hit the streets, but they don't shut down the streets to allow people to walk around. They just walk out. And so... Um, I, I wonder if we can just shorten that time. We had a presentation, just so the public knows, a couple weeks ago we asked about the parking lots, and TPD went through a full presentation on all that. And so we have heard the, the public's concern about the parking lots, and we did have a discussion, and TPD talked the, about the it. The volume of the large clubs that are just in those two blocks there, the sidewalks can't handle that amount of people all coming on at once. Um, and, one, and one of the things that you all had, had said in the meeting a couple weeks ago is that as soon as 3 o'clock hits, you try to... Your, your colleagues try to push people to their cars and then you try to push them out of the parking lots. So by like two, by like three thirty four, they're completely out of Ybor City, right? That's what well, you Well, ideally, yes. Um, I, again, you're probably gonna say no, but um, can you say anything about the mental health record of the person who was arrested um, or any of the people involved? I feel like I'm in my press conference. I wish I could answer questions. I just have to I ask can't. these questions because <laughs> this is what the public's asking us. And, and if we don't know, who they were, why they were there, whether they were on drugs or alcohol or not, whether they had been in bars, whether they were part of gangs, whether they had a mental health problem. We can't diagnose a solution because we don't know anything about what was involved. And some members of the public want an immediate solution. You provided the immediate solution. Can you tell us there were no incidents, that, no shootings on, on Halloween, uh, October 31st, correct? Not that were brought to my attention, no. And so what was the difference between Saturday night and, and October 31st? Well, one, it was a Saturday versus a Tuesday, just the dynamics of the crowd size. However, for a Tuesday night, it was a larger crowd size than a normal Tuesday night. But a Tuesday night is not anywhere near a Thursday, Friday, or Saturday night anymore. But uh, I, I guess the point to the public is it's not that the city's doing nothing. The TPD responded, and what you told me on that day was you personally were going there, you had more police officers, and you had police officers on, on horse back. You would sent that out in a press release, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so you did... I'm not n not saying that you all didn't do the right thing the other night. Maybe not, no police, no amount of police would have pre prevented it. But you all did move fast to make sure that Ebor was protected. So it's not the city is doing well, nothing. And not well. only that, we want the community to feel safe. We want them to come to Ebor. Yeah. Ebor is a safe place. And so everybody that I was walking around talking to that night, 
felt that way and they were very gracious of us coming by. And so, so I think, it, by the way, I didn't say this yet, but my office, four years ago, I moved my personal office to Ybor City. I have a bunch of employees who were worried the next day and we had to talk to them. Um, they eat at all the restaurants down. I eat it in Ybor um, this week it, it, because we want to support the restaurants and, and bars there and hope everybody will come back. It's not that the city's doing nothing. The city moved right away. Uh, Chief Burkall and Chief of Staff and Mayor moved right away to, to protect Ebor, to make sure Ebor is protected, and, and I think nothing has happened. I, I would make the same offer to your employees that I've done to other businesses. If you'd like me to come and speak, I'd be happy to come and speak to them. Okay, um, thank you. And um, the um, I've heard anecdotally that half of the people that were involved in the incident were under 21. Do we know how many people involved were under 21 or under 18? Part of the ongoing investigation. Um, the, when, when talking about a, an underage curfew, officers I've spoken to said that, they, that regardless of whether it's a civil penalty or, a, or a, um, a criminal penalty, that it's very difficult for them. They will get accused of, of um, picking people out, um, discriminating. They have to handle them. They have to manage them. It's not only that they're not there, but they, there's, there's not, no place for them to take them. Um, so maybe they'd have to get them in the car. Um, it seems like there's a lot of concerns about that. If we were going to propose it, I, I would like to have a more fulsome conversation about it. Um, so just, just to that end, is that the statute is very particular. The state adopted a statute, so the city would just be adopting something that's already on books, and all that would be clearly laid out of how we would do it before we would do it. And um, our, our officers do a, a great job, and they're willing to do, have any additional tools there but the most important is the keeping the kids safe. So and if we can I want to reunite them with their families, then that's what we're willing to do. Before chair cuts me off, I have a couple more questions. Um, the it, uh, bars say we had some examples this morning. They say they want to hire off-duty police officers, and they say they don't show up or they're not there. Now, what police officers have told me is that the rate that they pay for uh, uh, that that the city allows them to, these bars to pay is not very high, and that the bars. Would, re would be okay paying more if they could actually get the police officers. And so what, what I'm hearing is the city won't allow the, the, um, the bars to pay a higher amount to get the police officers, and because we have a shortage of officers, they can't get them. Is, this, is that true? I wish you would come to me directly about that because some of the information that you're getting, I'd like to know the officers is completely not correct. Well, that's why I wish, yeah. and to the chief of staff. You have my phone number. You could call me anytime. To the chief that. of staff, I wish somebody had briefed me on, you know, at least on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, um, and it's, you know, we're, I, I would just remind the administration, city council is half the government in the city. And um, we didn't get any information at all. Well, I would, I would say that that's also incorrect. Uh, you all got a media alert that morning. In addition to that, since it was 6 a.m., the chief of staff took it upon himself to go above and beyond that and text you all that, which is not in the standard protocol. And then in addition to that, we, every other media alert, you got the updates. You could see on our social media what we're doing. I'm giving you all the same information in real time and even before the media if you all get the media alert. I'm not trying that. to criticize you, but but getting press releases, we're city council members. Did the mayor only get um, the PIO reports? I don't think so. Did the mayor only get a, one text from the chief of staff or a couple texts from the chief of staff? I'm, I'm not blaming you, but that I sent an email a couple days ago to the chief of staff saying I was disappointed that, that I was not briefed at all. And instead of telling me that he would call me with a briefing, he said that he sent me the list that said, you've got PI, PI reports. That's what everybody in the public's getting. If the mayor only got the PI reports, then that's fine. We're half of this government, and I'm not criticizing you, we're half of this government, we have to be briefed on this because the public is asking us questions about these things. Councilman, with all due respect, I believe that that's uh, factually incorrect, and you are getting the briefings that we can give you. Uh, it's not factually correct. I called you on my own the other day, and I asked you a few questions. You pointed me to the PIO, sorry, the, to the press releases, and I knew you were running to Halloween, and so I didn't hold you up. But Every I didn't question get you're asking me here is the same thing that's in those media alerts. I'm giving all that information that I can give to the public. I don't know what other information you would expect, and if you add other questions, you can pick up the phone and call me. I, I did, and, I, and, and I what you did you. is you pointed me back to the press releases. Again, I'm not blaming you. The administration, even during the last two hurricanes, did not brief us on anything that was going on in those well, briefings. And this so, isn't about the hurricanes. This is about this incident. I understand and, that, sir. But the, 
the the city of the, the the people in the city deserve to know what's going on with this situation, and the people of the city elected us to represent them. We represent districts. A, a, a child in my district or a person in my district was killed, and I didn't know that until I read the press until I read the newspaper. So and, I would I would and, respectfully again point you back to the law. Marcy's law requires that I am not allowed to release a victim's name or any identifying features. If even I to could, an officer again, of the city. Even did you, did you the release city. the name to the mayor? I cannot release that. To did the mayor know the names of the people involved? Did the mayor have any other briefing from you or the chief of staff between uh, Sunday morning and now? The mayor is the chief law enforcement officer of this area. And, and city council, which is half by charter, half of this I, government is not entitled to. I don't want to have this discussion with you. I respect you for what you do. The point is that for whatever reason, the mayor and the chief of staff don't feel like it's important but, to brief city council. But respectfully, members. again, you are having the conversation with me. And this shouldn't be about politics. This should be about coming together. It's not together about and politics, sir. Solution. That's very offensive. This is about giving the members of the public a sense of safety and security. I'm very involved in the Ebor City community, and I couldn't answer people's basic questions because I didn't have any other information besides what's in the press releases. I'm here. And most to, of the time, I got information from I'm the media. I'm here willing to work with council. The community. I have one more thing I want to show before I run out of time. Uh, could you put the one that has the bar across the top? Yeah, that one. No, no, that's the wrong one. Um, I'll tell you what, just put, yeah, just put that. Um, this is a chart, this is a chart that um, Chief, I think Chief Burkhall gave me. Up until 2020, the number is, um, is uh, confirmed in the FBI statistics. So you see from 2018 to 2020, the violent crime rate in the city, this is only the city of Tampa, spiked. And then Chief Burkhaw gave me this um, additional form a couple months ago when I was doing Tampa Scorecard, which shows 2021 and 2022. And what that shows is that it went down slightly. Uh, but what we've seen is a spike in violent crime rate. And this is citywide, not Ebor. Citywide in the city of Tampa, violent crime rate, FBI statistics. The, the statistics for 2021 and 2022, um, the, the police chief has not yet sent to the FBI. That's why it's not an official FBI uh, chart. But what we see wait, is a wait, spike. Wait, I'm sorry. What did you say that I didn't send stats to the FBI? That's no, inaccurate, sir. You, you, if you send it to them and they haven't published them, sorry, was that? And you said that I did not, and that's completely inaccurate. We have sent our stats to the FBI. I'm not trying to argue with you about no, this. No, I'm they, just correcting a statement okay. you said. The, the, so they have not, because all the cities have not uh, uh, put their data in. This is not. You cannot find this chart with 2021 and 2020. Uh, to on the FBI chart. All you can find is up to uh, 2020. What that shows is the violent crime rate spiked. And um, uh, the, the question here, and, and anecdotally from the PIA reports, uh, it seems like there's a, a <coughs> gun violence crime at least a couple times a week for the last few weeks. I'm hearing from other law enforcement agencies that violent crime is really spiking the last few weeks or months and that gun violence is really spiking in the city of Tampa and that it is, and that, and this is the FBI statistic up till 2021 that showed it spiking. Um, isn't, th my question is, isn't this a citywide problem, not just an Ebor City problem? All right, so and the stats here show that gun violence and violent crime spiked, and that was after the COVID time and the uh, civil unrest, and that's a nationwide problem. It spiked across the entire nation at much higher levels than it spiked here. However, in 2023, violent crime and violent crime of the farm is on the decline. Prior to this incident, we were down significantly in violent crime and violent crime of the firearm. Lisa, do you, the other chart, the bar chart you have, does that show violent crime by city? Yes. Could you just put that down, please? Mm -hmm. This is only of 2020. And that shows that we're less than, can you push it down a little bit? That shows that as of 2020, no, the other, Down. One, the other one. Sorry, and and Lisa's helping me because my aide had to go pick up her kid. Oh. But um, so thank you. <laughs> I was going to um, ask. This is violent crime per hundred thousand population, though. By the way, it's not total, so you have to extrapolate out. Um, but it shows, yeah, compared at least as of twenty twenty one, on a on a per one hundred thousand basis, we had lower violent crime. But can you put the other chart back up? <laughs> What's good about this one that you're showing too is it's a population rate, and that's a better way to compare crime. Yeah. So I want to be fair and show. The, the two different ones, but the point is that we, we have a, a, a violent crime problem in the city of Tampa, and I think you've been brought on to try to fix that. And, um, the, and again, the numbers you're showing are old numbers. Significant reduction already year to date in violent crime, and we've showed that. Well, unfortunately, with these uh, FBI statistics, they're so far delayed 
that we can't operate in a year or two in, re in rears for our strategic deployment. So that's why we <coughs> use more up-to-date stats, and that's why we use the major city chiefs, because all the chiefs are reporting, and we get to see that right away. And, and unfortunately, with the FBI, this data isn't updated in a timely fashion. And do you know, um, in the last three months or so, have you seen a, a particular spike in gun violence or violent crime? Year to date, prior to what happened, violent crime, the violent crime of the firearm was down significantly. What about just in the last three months? Are you seeing a, a pickup just in the last few months? I'd have to go back and analyze it over the last three months, but year to date, it's down significantly. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, before I go to Council Member Vieira, Council Member Miranda, do you want to speak as well? Um, I'm just, uh, just a character to listen, and uh, I haven't learned much. Wait a minute. But um, oh, sir. I, don't, I don't doubt you one word. Uh, I've known you for many years. Uh, the police department is doing everything that they're supposed to do in the city of Tampa, all over. And a child that is murdered or killed in one district, the child is murdered and killed in every district. So if something doesn't happen in my district, it happens in the whole city of Tampa. If there's a rape, if there's a killing, if there's a murder, whatever you want to call it, it's the whole city of Tampa, not my district, not anyone's district here. We're all in the same boat, rowing the same oars at the same that we have to get to point A to point B. Your job, and you're doing it quite well, is to make sure that we try to rein it in and bring it down to zero, which is impossible. Why was the crime rate different when I was a kid? There was no guns. None. Five or six people that were in the mob had it, and the police had the rest. Nobody had a gun. The problem today, society is, we got 350 million, and you got 800 million guns. Everybody's got three or four guns. That's why we're not invaded. They're not afraid of the army. They're afraid of the population turning on whoever's invading. We got more guns than any big army has in this country. We may not have airplanes. We may not have submarines, but we sure as hell have guns. And what you're doing and what your police officers are doing, exactly what you were trained to do. <coughs> I am not a trained police officer. I do have a degree in criminology. And I have to differ with a lot of things that have been said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, before I go to Councilmember Vieira, you know, I woke up Sunday morning. I go to church very early. And I turn on my work phone. And the first text that I got was from Chief of Staff John Bennett. I checked the news. I, I, I already knew what was going on. I saw the news, but Chief Bennett was the first point of communication that I had, he said, you know, we're on it, we're, 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 we're you know, there's press conferences, there's, this. he kept me updated, and I appreciate that. And then I saw what I saw in the news, and I saw everything from worst mass shooting in Ybor City history, two dead, possibly more, 18 injured, you know, the media will, they're, they're it, it's a very fast moving story, and they're trying to catch up and give the, uh, the news. We heard from a lot of people in the public, residents, a lot of business owners, property owners, people that are leasing, people that talked about how they struggled through COVID because there were shutdowns, there were regulations, everything that happened, and now this. And, you know, I will tell you that when I think of Ybor City, I think about uh, a safe and happy place. I've been going to Ybor City with my grandmother as a kid, with my parents as a kid. Um, and when I was 18, you know, a couple months in, I went to my first club, you know, now that I was legally allowed to go and not allowed to drink, but there, I've never had an issue. You know, now I'm older, I'm married, and I have two stepdaughters, so when I go to Ybor City, I go to Chill Brothers Ice Cream, I go to King Corona for a cigar, whatever it is, I don't do the club thing, or we go to eat. Again, I've never had an issue in Ybor City, and I'm there... I go after church. I'm at church at 7.30 in the morning here in downtown. I'll go to Ybor City and just take a walk. I'll grab a cup of coffee somewhere and I go to Ybor City. I go at night. When I bring people from out of town, people that are visiting here, family or friends, I always take them to Ybor City. And everybody's always with their, with their mouth open, going, wow, well, look at this place. You know, we have a national historic landmark district. My grandparents and my mom and my aunt, when they were young, in the 60s and 70s, because they they came from Cuba 60 years ago and came here to Tampa. They talk about their early memories of Ybor City, Las Novedades, which is no longer there. Now it's Haya, and the, and the Columbia Restaurant. But in the 70s and 80s, they talk about 
Well, we didn't go to Ybor City. We didn't go to Ybor City because you could stand in the middle of 7th Avenue in the middle of the day and take a quarter and throw it down the street and you could hear it clink. Nobody was there or there was crime. They would go to the Columbia restaurant <coughs> on Saturday night. Every weekend my grandparents would go and they would go home. But beyond that, there was no Ybor City in that time period. There was, but not like we know it. And then people started coming in and investing and turning that neighborhood around, the residents, the neighborhood associations, the business owners, the property owners, and look at what a beautiful place it is. So what I'm saying is one incident, because the numbers were there. You know, We have 1% of whatever. This is something that in Ybor City, there have been issues in the past. However, um, I don't want this to, to, to leave a bad taste in people's mouths at oh, Ybor City. Because I already heard one person say, I'll never go there at night. And I go, but, but this could happen anywhere. Bayshore is dangerous at 3 in the morning. West Tampa is dangerous at 3 in the morning. It doesn't matter. Crime doesn't have a zip code. It can go anywhere, and it doesn't matter what time. So I'll end with, it was proposed. And I'm glad that Councilwoman Henderson brought this up because it sparked the discussion. People came down here and took time out of their day because people have been here for hours, especially business owners, residents coming down here uh, to say what they feel. And we were talking about shutting down businesses at 1 o'clock. I've heard from, from both sides, I don't agree with that. Why punish the business owners? Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how the police department works. You're the chief and that is, you know, are the police officers, I'm not telling you what to do, but are the police officers walking the beat throughout the night? Because there are 50 officers in the area and you have the sheriff's mm -hmm. office mm -hmm. main uh, station right there. But are they walking the beat? Are they interacting with people or the police officers in one area going, well, if something happens, we can run there. And they did because I've seen videos where the yep. something happens and those officers are running into danger because they are brave and they are doing their job. Um, can we do better? We talked about mounted police patrol, you know, police on horseback, which are my favorite. They're so impressive <coughs> and it's so wow. But the, the respect that they command, you see an officer on horseback, mm -hmm. at least to me, I go, huh, yeah. you know, Respect, you know, be good. But if I'm an Ebor and I'm, a, yeah, let's say I'm a teenager again and I'm walking down the street, and I was a good kid, but if an officer would have approached me, because I'm, you know, let's say I'm 16 years old at the time and said, hey, how you doing? Oh, good, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to go down to the Columbia restaurant for a Cuban sandwich. Oh, okay, well, you know, uh, how old are you? 16 years old, whatever it is, that police officer has interacted with me, so I'm already, I'm going, you know, I'm being watched. I don't want to, I don't want to do anything bad because, you know, they're here, they're watching. So, I don't know by a policy standpoint, I think the police do a great job. You know, when I'm in Ebor, again, you know, you have Tampa Fire's there, police are there. Um, I think this is a, a, a larger community conversation. I don't want to punish any business owners because when you say, oh, close at 1, the bar stops serving at 12.30 or 12.15, saying last call. You know, when we're talking about losing revenue, that's a lot of revenue. And I know those landlords aren't saying, uh, well, you're closing early. I'm going to reduce your rent because you're, you're, you're working less hours. <laughs> they're, they're, the, the overhead is there. The costs are there. The employees are there. I have friends in college that worked at restaurants till 10, 1030 at night, and they would work as bartenders somewhere else, you know, until 3 in the morning to make up for that, that extra income. I don't want to hurt those people. Um, I don't want, you see, like when we do, if it's like a six-month moratorium where we say six months, the bars close at 1 o'clock, Psychologically, it may put it into people's heads, well, Ebor, you know, it's a six month thing, we're trying it out, but it puts in people's heads, well, Ebor's closed at one o'clock. And then we take that restriction off and it goes back to three, and people already have it going, ah, Ebor closed early, even though it's changed. They got used to something, doing something else. <laughs> I think this is a larger community conversation um, where we talk to the business owners, they came here, uh, we talk to the residents. You know, people want to feel safe, but at the end of the day, I want people safe. And I don't want Ebor City's uh, reputation damaged. And it's not just, Ebor City is a topic of conversation today, but this is a citywide issue. I mean, there's violence all throughout, and I know you as chief and, and with the mayor, uh, and even with city council, you know, we want to make this place a, a safer place. Councilman Carlson brought up, you know, violent crime, and there's two charts per 100,000 uh, people. It's a, it's a, you know, more accurate chart, but then you see the rising in crime and this and that. We just have to look at different uh, policy decisions and see where we're going. And that's what you do. You know, where are we deficient and where can we do better? But at the end of the day, you know, people keep saying knee-jerk reaction, knee-jerk reaction. I don't want to hurt the business owners because if I, and, and it's an active case and you can't answer a lot of questions and I understand that, but we don't have all the details. 
And when we don't have all the details, I don't think we should make quick policy decisions like this. We need to look at other things, uh, other, other things that we can do to uh, be better, protect the area. But I'll close with, again, I'm, I'm grateful that Councilwoman Henderson brought this up because, I mean, when, yesterday when the news came out, hey, did you see the news? And it trickled from there, but it got people talking. And that's where we begin is with that conversation. Thank you very much, Councilman Can I just add to that? that yes, sir. We all want the exact same thing. Yeah. Everything that every single one of you want exactly is what we want. And it's coming together and working together and all the stakeholders. And, and I agree. I listened to the public comments earlier, and, and I think that's great, is getting all the ideas and find out what works best for Tampa and looking at all the options. Because we do need to move forward, and we need to do things different. And I think one is a collaborative effort. The police can't do it alone. Thank you. Councilman Beer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chief Burkhoff, for all that you do. And, you know, this, this to me is, a, is an, an Ebor tragedy, and it's a Tampa tragedy, and it gives a lot of folks pause to come forward and say, how can we improve Ebor City? Nobody wants to see Ebor City fall not only to the reality of, of crime, of violent crime that was seen as, as its worst over the weekend, um, but perception. Uh, that perception hurts the communities, it hurts the businesses, it hurts the businesses, the families that, that work in those businesses and the families that those businesses represent. Um, and, and this is obviously about, I believe it was 18 individuals uh, who, were, who were injured and hurt and two individuals who ultimately died. And um, it's uh, tragic. The, the young gentleman, uh, Harrison, one of the two individuals who died was uh, um, just uh, from everything I've heard from individuals, a fine individual who, you know, fought like hell just to get the first base in life. And, uh, and it's a tragedy uh, beyond words. Um, but this to me is not about, uh, uh, you know, other uh, collateral issues. It's about making sure that just Ebor City is saved in the public mind, saved in, 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 uh, in, in perception, et cetera. I, I also wanted to salute Councilman Henderson. I'm going to go through some of the ideas that from uh, the, I think it was the Tampa Bay Times or Tampa Bay Business Journal, I, I read about that, that she talked about that, that we can go forward on in one way or another. I always say on uh, ideas that come before city council that we're not marrying them, we're not engaged to them, we're dating them, right? right? And there are some ideas that I think we can date, we can go have a coffee with, maybe go watch a movie with, whatever, um, and, and whatnot. I think we need to be responsive on this issue. The, the, this tragedy, the, the level, the scope of the tragedy uh, does require some response on the part of city council with the information that we do know. Um, however, it is well taken that, that in, in being responsive, we need to have wisdom, we need to be judicious, um, but we, we have to keep in mind people's rights, of course. Um, someone once said there's the Bill of Rights, but there's also the Bill of Obligations, and we have to make sure that people are aware of not only their rights, but their obligations in making Ebor City better. And in that regard, I think we all have something to do uh, in, in the Ebor City community. So, you know, there have been a couple of proposals. Chief, you've talked about keeping 7th Avenue open as, 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 as long as possible. I think that all seven of us uh, give your opinion in that regard a whole lot of difference because you know public safety is always issue number one. Um, Councilwoman Henderson, I read in the paper, also talked about stepping up code enforcement to crack down on noise violations and on different violations. I think that's something that we can all support. Um, Councilwoman Henderson talked about loitering, public drinking, and other infractions and looking at these. Again, I think that's something we can all support. That's not, that's not controversial. Councilman Henderson talked about engaging with Hillsborough County Public Schools, having messages sent out to parents going, you know what, don't, send, don't have young folks in Ybor City, et cetera. I think that's a very good message. I really, really do. Um, it, folks have talked about, I don't know if it was the mayor or Councilman Henderson or whoever it was, looking at some sort of a youth curfew, right? Uh, uh, stepping into what the, the state apparently already has and doing it in a manner that's consistent with law uh, for, for civil infractions. Again, that's an idea we should date. Um, I, I, I don't think that's controversial at all. Um, there's that saying we always tell people whenever it comes to crime, which is, if you see something, say something. Well, we as a city government saw what happened over the weekend in Ybor City, and I think it's incumbent on us to do something, to do something that is measured, again, that has wisdom, that is judicious, but that is responsive to what we know 
about this tragedy that happened. Um, and, and in that regard, again, we, we thank Councilwoman Henderson uh, for her leadership in that regard. And, and for yourself, Chief Burkhall, we're gonna continue to rely on your expertise um, on, on these issues and the words of, your, um, of the many police officers with whom you serve who showed exceptional courage that evening, um, as they always do. It, it was a, a good reminder on why our police are so important here in Tampa. We don't want, again, Ybor City to either fall victim to violent crime or the perception of that in the public eye. Thank God the city of Tampa has avoided what a lot of other cities, I believe, have gone through. Cities like Minneapolis, like Portland, et cetera. But we don't want a slice of Portland, so to speak, um, in reality or as a perception to be an Ebor city. The, the, again, whenever crime uh, uh, invades neighborhoods, it is the most marginalized, it is the businesses, it is the families that get hurt the most, and we have to fight that. So again, there are things that we can do that we can put forward for consideration, I think, that are not overstepping and overreaction, et cetera, in my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mayor. Just comment just yes, on sir. that. So it's funny you say that, and I agree 100% with every council member of what we're saying coming together. And it was, I was researching an old project I did in 2009 in Ybor City. I was the shift commander at the time. And the issue that we had was the extra duty ordinance and the clubs that were grandfathered in. And to Councilman Carlson's point when he brought that up, is that's part of something that needs to be revised. And looking at Orlando's plan, I would encourage you all to look at that. That's got some great ideas in there that actually solves a lot of those issues of those clubs that are already exempt from that existing ordinance. So that's something that we definitely need to look at for moving forward. Thank you very much, Councilwoman Hertak. Thank you. Um, I wanna first start out by uh, sending my condolences to the families of the victims and uh, anyone who's still dealing with their personal aftermath, whether it be physical or emotional. Uh, any type of event like that is, is very traumatic. The thing we haven't talked about that no one's really mentioned is that it's the guns. Unfortunately, we have very permissive gun laws in the state of Florida, so there's not much we can do about it. This is where we ask for the public's help. The public can certainly reach out to their legislators and their governor to tell them they don't want concealed carry, permitless concealed carry anymore, so that anyone can carry a gun at any time. That's one of the reasons we're here. There's already a great plan in Ebor. I went down and did a close out of Ebor, and if you haven't done that, you need to. It's very enlightening. I really enjoyed my time with the officers. Uh, we actually, when we were there, walked up to several groups of people who were having verbal altercations to diffuse the situation. And the officers are really good. They have incredible ways of talking to drunk people. It's really fun and cute. And they ha a lot of the officers just have a really jovial mentality. It doesn't happen overnight. No, <laughs> but, but that's what they say is that they learn that the, the, the fun, you know, if you keep it light and if you keep it you know, from being serious, if they themselves have that forward thinking, that it really does help. However, one of the things that we've all talked about, we are trying to work on. The parking lot safety, I've been trying to work on since I got on council, making sure that we have the ordinance that's already in place, that it's enforced, so that the officers can be on 7th Avenue and not policing parking lots where they should should not need to be because a lot of those parking lots are off of 7th Avenue. We've also talked about code enforcement last year, talked about making code enforcement 24 seven, got big pushback on that. So I would love to see more funding going toward making code enforcement a 24 seven operation. One of the ideas that was even floated before this happened was teaming a yet uh, the clean team, I think they call them yes, block yes, yes team, with, with a code enforcement officer in the evening hours so they feel safer, their safety in numbers, and there is an actual enforcement. Code enforcement can actually do something that, that the yes team can't. So 
I think that's very important. These are things we've already talked about. We just need to move forward with them. Overall, I do not believe this is solely an e-war problem. It's, it's a gun violence problem throughout the city. It's a congregation problem throughout the city. First of all, and the absolute first thing the administration and every single council member should do right now is to encourage people to go to Ebor. There's no safer time to be in Ebor right now. We have more patrols. Um, the businesses need our help. We just need to show people that Ebor City is a safe place. We know that the numbers support that, but let's, let's really encourage people to go out and enjoy Ebor in a time that works for them so that they're comfortable. When talking with the officers when I closed Ebor, I'm interested that people are talking about closing the street or not closing the street because I felt the difference in security from a closed street to an open street. And the, the closed street to me felt a lot safer and the officers said the same thing. There's no line of sight issues. There's no concern about uh, drive-by shootings, yelling out the window, people drinking and driving through. So those are my main concerns when we're talking about possibly opening a street because I believe that's like an open air bar on wheels. We can't control what goes on in that car. We don't know. There's tinted windows, there's bass music, there's all the parking along the street. So I believe that's a conversation to have, but if we're gonna keep the streets open, maybe not to keep the parking on the side streets or on that street, because that was a real barrier to visibility that the officer shared with me that they really love that line of sight especially the officers I spoke to who were off duty in front of some of the clubs, uh, talked about that as being very important to them. We don't need to know the details of this incident in order to move forward on working on this, this issue because these are the things that we should have been working on before. These are the things that community has brought up time and time again, and now is a really good time to work on them. We need to extend stay and play. We need to have somewhere for youth to go on the evenings and weekends. When I was growing up, I was a straight edge punk rock kid. And I credit those all ages shows that I went to as being absolutely critical to me becoming who I was. But at that time in the 90s, we also had coffee shops that were open until 2 a.m. that I could go to illegally and hang out with my friends. We don't have anything like that right now. You've got kava bars and those are 18 and up and you've got all these different things but we don't have anywhere to send kids. So it's not that expensive to open stay and play, just not in the summer but let's consider doing it in some specific rec areas around the city. We even talked about this during the budget. So these are ideas, again, that we've already thought of. We just need to move the needle uh, the other thing when I've talked to community members that they really wanted to highlight is focusing on youth employment more. More youth employment opportunities, not just the summer programs, but how do we encourage that to keep going so that kids on Saturday night need to be in bed so that they can work their coffee shift in the morning or whatever else they're doing if they have that after school weekend job. Not everybody's gonna have them, but enough people. So, so those are the types of things I'd love to see. I did hear a ton from the artistic community today, whether it be, whether it be the, the event community, because art is not just static art. Art is also the clubs. It's dancing. It's going to see a show, listening to you know, a band. That's creative, and those artists all feed off of one another. So how we continue to encourage the artist collaboration, because once those clubs and things go, artists won't stay. They're gonna wanna go where the artists congregate already. So my fear of gentrification is large. We, there's plenty of space in Ebor and has been historically for both daytime activities and nighttime activities. There can, there's still plenty of open storefronts along 7th Avenue that can be things that are going on during the day. We should encourage that. It is a 24-7 district. It always has been. Maybe a couple hours in the wee hours in the morning. 
But creatives, again, are nighttime people. Not all of them, but a good majority of them. They want to be out at night. The folks who came in front of us today, normal, average people, they just work different hours than the rest of us. And I think we all need to keep that in consideration. These aren't, this isn't some sort of weird subculture. This is a good majority of our community. We're trying to encourage youth to, to move to Tampa. They really love to go out and go to bars and go to clubs and just how we make it safe. Ebor, as the officer said, and we're very proud of when I was, uh, did the nighttime patrol, is how officers from other cities came to see how Ebor closes down because we're a model for other cities. And I think we just need to lean into what we're good at and then expand on some of these activities that, again, we've already thought about. We need to have a community conversation about these possible other things. I am very concerned about a ju juvenile curfew just on the, the, the front merits. We are not that far um, removed from Biking Wall Black. That's a huge concern for a lot of the community. There would have to be a lot of quota issues that I'd be really concerned about. I would want so much oversight over that. I'm also concerned because officers often uh, in e I cannot imagine taking one of those 50 officers off the street in Ebor to take that juvenile to um, you know, station three. or I, We'd have to figure out how that works. So I am concerned about that. I'm also concerned because some parents are more permissive than others. And I don't know that a uh, curfew is going to affect them. I think the parents will just, some parents are fine with it, some parents aren't. Right now we're in a culture of parental control over pretty much everything. I think we get some pushback from parents on that. So I'm, I'm less inclined to look at curfews as the first answer. I think it's part of a community conversation, but I would not vote for it today. And but the last thing I want to talk about is I know that Chief Tripp had talked about a mobile TFR unit in Ebor, possibly on like a golf cart or something. So we always have folks in Ebor. I don't know where that is right now, but we were lucky to have um, a rescue car already in the vicinity. But just simply to have that golf cart slash, you know, quick mobile unit in the area will also help uh, in with with many different issues. And and it's just another it's another visualization of first responders that people can see while they're out and about. Uh, I do love to see something say something. I think maybe we need to, to focus on a larger <coughs> citywide, um, maybe make it Tampa somehow, you know, make it, I'm not very good at slogans, that's my Safer colleagues. together. Yeah, you know, well, no, but see something, say something, just, you know, kind of more of a directive. Safer together doesn't tell people to do something. So you need an active verb. But yes, uh, overall, I think that our police office, or our TPD should be commended for the work they already do in Ebor. And let's just work together to make it even safer and to have a place for youth to go so that that is not a choice of theirs. Thank you. Thank may, you very may much. I just add a few things? Because you all, if you recall, for the budget, we were able to approve the expansion of the PAL. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thank you all for doing that so much. And the PAL boxing program, which is already a success, is even kicking off greater. And that's a, it's, it's not enough, but it is one resource for our youth to go to. And if you recall, our officer of the month we had for shielding our teens is helping teens get jobs. That's a national model that's actually being looked at. So we're, we're doing a lot of great things, but there's always more. We could always use more. And that's, again, the police department can't do it all ourselves. The, um, the other thing about Ebor is I would encourage anybody to come out. I'm going to be in Ebor on Saturday night. Anybody that wants to come out and have a cafe con leche with me, feel free. I'm a little nervous about you, Chairman, because you, you're going to run towards the horse, I think. <laughs> I love horses. It's, you know. But uh, feel free to, to come out. If you want to come out, have a cup of coffee with me and... and and see how things operate, I'll be out there. All right, I'll go to you, Councilman Carlson. Saturday night, my wife and I don't have the kids. I'm not trying to be funny here, but I'm gonna tell her, let's take the streetcar, it's date night, it, we always, there's <laughs> always a kid. But I wanna take the streetcar to Ybor City, and I, you know, like Councilwoman Hertag said, there's no safer time to go to Ybor than right now. 
fine. This is a conversation <coughs> that we're having now, but again, I don't want to, I don't want Ybor City to be tainted because of this. Mm -hmm. It's horrible. What happened is horrible. I don't wish it on anybody. Um, but again, we have to have this, you know, the, I'm glad that this conversation is happening because we can always do better. We're not perfect, but we can always strive to be better. And, and I appreciate all the work that the Tampa Police Department does. You had 50 officers there, but the situation was what the situation was, but we need to look at changes that we can make to prevent these things in the future. Um, everybody brought up great, uh, great points. Uh, and moving forward. So I, I thank everyone. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, uh, just a couple added things. I, I said it this morning, but I, you know, watching the video of um, the police officers standing up straight and walking into the line of fire is, it was a very emotional experience. And I just want to thank um, the hardworking men and women of the police department who put their lives on the line every day uh, for their bravery. Thank you to Chief Burkhoff for going in on Tuesday night also. Um, I, I forgot to mention this morning, the, um, the Tampa fire rescue people, if you look at the videos, nobody knew exactly what was going on, and it, but there were people who had been shot and hurt and the, and the TFR people were, were attending to them on the streets, not, not knowing what might happen around them, but trying to protect the citizens. And I wanna thank them uh, for what they do every day. Um, also, just for Ebor, you know, I, I personally believe strongly in Ebor and the vision and history of Ebor. Um, I'm, I'm a huge history fanatic about Ebor. I've got a, a mural that I commissioned in my office for um, of Jose Marti and the, the great history there. Ebor has so much history in so many different levels. Um, as communities change very often, they are changed by uh, big development that comes in and does away with all the history. In this case, we have a lot of big players that have come into Ebor and they all are sensitive to the history and culture. If you see what's being built there, some of the buildings look like they're 100 years old, but they're new. And the old buildings are being restored and renovated. Um, things are changing in a very positive way in Ybor, and it's a shame that this happened. Um, and you know, condolences to the families that were affected, and condolences or, or, or regards to the, the employees in uh, Ybor who, have, who also have been um, traumatized by this and hurt financially by it. Um, Ebor is changing in such a positive way, though, that, that I hope everybody will go support Ebor. All the different stores, it's not just a bar district. Um, a year ago, I brought in uh, Peter Kagiyama, uh, who's an expert on, um, on growing cities and developing cities. He's based in St. Pete, but he's, he's a national, international expert. And two of the key things he says about turning around cities, number one is it's really important uh, to see people walking dogs. And so the council member Hertek should take hers, all of hers. Uh, but Daryl Shaw, who's in the audience, and his partners built a building uh, that looks like it's a historic building in an area that wasn't very busy in Ebor. And next to it, they invested in building a dog park. And that dog park is crowded all the time. And there are people walking dogs in Ebor. And what Peter Kagiyama says is that when you see people walking dogs, you feel safer. That is is helping. To, that's a, a small but big a small thing, but a big investment that's helping to change the way people see and experience Ebor. Uh, restaurants are coming back, new restaurants are coming in, and everybody's trying to be sensitive to the culture. But even more importantly, the second big thing to changing a city is the arts. And typically the arts get run out as big developers come in. In this case, all the different big owners in Ebor are investing in the arts in a, in a smart way. A year ago with, with um, uh, Amanda Post from HCC, I started a group of, just an ad hoc group of arts people meeting in Ebor once a month, and it grew from a couple people to now we have about 70 people once a month. It's the last Wednesday of every month. Anybody who's interested in the arts, wants to support the arts in Ebor, is there's an artist who wants to move to Ebor, please join us. It's just an ad hoc group that meets at the Haya Hotel to talk about the arts. And uh, we, we're, we're trying to grow up, but there's 70 people that meet. We had somebody from St. Pete come last week and watch us, the mayor's been, and it is one of the most exciting, inspiring things you'll see about how the arts are transforming. Guillermo comes, who was the artist who spoke earlier, um, the arts are transforming Ebor in a big way. Uh, Daryl and his investors have taken the old Crest building, historic building, and changed three stories of it to be all arts. And they're subsidizing, bringing the arts in, uh, just like St. Pete has in Dumbo and New York and others. And it, it's a, it's a long-term investment in the arts, which is changing the way people look at and experience <coughs> it. Last month, we had our second annual 
Ebor Arts Walk, which again brought hundreds of people in to experience the arts at night in Ebor. And uh, we're gonna have another one in, in March, so we're gonna start doing it a couple times a year. Thing, very positive things are happening, and I welcome everybody to please come support the businesses, support the artists, uh, support the bars and restaurants in Ebor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that concludes the discussion. So if anybody has any motions to make. I, I do have one quick announcement that we're getting ready to release. We just found out today that the police department was awarded the grant for the 30 officers. From, so this is great news for us. Good. So that came out with several other grants. And my understanding is not many cities got that grant. So that's a, a huge plus for us. So we're very excited about that. It's well deserved. And I know that we need it. And good. I'm very happy to hear that. Councilwoman Henderson, do you have a motion tonight? You know, I do. And um, just a quick little recap um, of just closing out a few thoughts. Um, I really appreciate you coming back again today. I know your schedule is tight. Um, and shedding light on it from a police perspective um, and all that your officers do out there to keep our city safe. So I just really appreciate that. I also appreciate the citizens um, and business owners of Ybor City, um, those who own the buildings and those who lease the buildings, particularly your conversation uh, with Dr. Glenn, my Florida a and University brother. I called on him because um, it was important for me because that is a place that I actually have visited. I'm not a late night, three o'clock in the morning kind of girl, but I will do something before 10 p.m. And I really appreciate my conversation with him and understanding the dynamics of his business and what two hours can do, um, especially in light of surviving a pandemic. Again, a proposal is a proposal. And it's just really important that we as a community put things out there What's being thought? Is this a good idea? Is it not a good idea? The community has spoken, and I greatly appreciate that. I don't feel beaten up, you know. Um, I don't feel threatened when I make a decision to bring something forward because there's always a teachable moment, and there's no way a conversation like this could have been generated today without me doing what I did. So in light of all of the community input, which is extremely valuable, I really do appreciate it. It is a test of your resiliency as a community. It's a testament to how you feel about Ebor, um, how we all care about it. And for those who are outside of the Ebor area, I know that um, the structure of crime can happen anywhere not just in Tampa, but all over the United States. It's just a really volatile time for all of us. And as I stood out at my Florida a and University homecoming in Tallahassee uh, all weekend when I got the news from um, Chief Bennett, I stood there and I felt safe. Thousands of Rattlers all congregating together. But when I got back to my Airbnb, there was a shooting incident that was homecoming adjacent. And so it can happen anywhere, and I do understand that. Our safety is always going to be a concern, whether it's for our children or even for ourselves, because it can happen anywhere. We know that in Walmart, in the grocery stores. It doesn't matter. And so we can't prevent every single aspect of it, but to safeguard ourselves, I would like to make this motion to at least, um, look, I had it written out, to explore um, some funding, maybe CRA dollars, that can be utilized for additional solutions, such as increasing. <coughs> I, I, increasing the, the yeah, we did it. for the legal department. Okay, people. you okay? You know yeah. what? Thank you. But there's okay. So what about the youth ambassador? I mean, I'm sorry, the Ebor ambassador program. I haven't done nothing. Though. Okay, so I'll just leave it at that. Is to look for some CRA dollars um, for the Ebor ambassador program and equipping law enforcement with necessary technology um, that was brought up to date. So the technical piece, if we have any funding to enforce um, the existing NORS ordinances or improving code enforcement. I, would, you, would you like to wait for the CRA? Yeah, I think we have to, to wait for the, for the CRA. Oh yeah, you know what, I am the CRA. Yeah. But you know Massey what, you're right. Here, so. Yeah. So I, th Mr. I, th Massey, I think but could, that's, so that's what I'm thinking and I will propose that at the CRA uh, meeting that's gonna be coming up next week but it is a thought process in my mind. Thank you for reminding me this is not a CRA. Quickly, I believe there's a motion that, that uh, for the, a memorandum made yes. 
for uh, the Tampa Police Department to come back and present a community policing plan to you all as council. Right. Once that community policing plan, plan for Ybor City is blessed by you all, mm -hmm. then CRA funding can be utilized to implement okay. that plan. That's okay, how that well, I'll work. get with you to address it from a technology standpoint and a, 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 a Ybor Ambassador stand, program standpoint. And Chief, if you're gonna be in Ybor Saturday, I may give you a call. Absolutely. We, my wife and I may join you for that cup of coffee. But the point I'm making is to encourage people to go to Ebor, yeah. you know, Absolutely. and not deter that. And council, council, again, the council a woman Hertek is right. You know, it, the, there's no safer time than now, and we don't want to <laughs> discourage, you know, anything else. Yes, sir. I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for being straightforward and telling us exactly what's going on and uh, to the job that you. Ladies and gentlemen of the police department, all, including the fire department, are doing to make us safe uh, every day of our lives. You have a very difficult job. It's not easy. The rain comes, and you know when it's coming because the weatherman tells you it's going to rain two days, and it happens. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the time. But in your case, you can't predict what's going to happen. It happens, and you have to react instantaneously. And for that, your job is very difficult. Thank you. Thank you for what you guys do, all of you, men and women of both divisions, fire and police and so forth. Thank you. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Hertek, you have something? Yes, uh, because we've all had our say, but at, um, Councilwoman Henderson has things that she's going to bring up to the CRA, and we have some policing plans. But we still have to figure out what we're doing in the, in the meantime. And what I heard over and over again <coughs> is the community wants to be heard. You all have created a great community conversation uh, model. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you might take some of the public comment that I know you were out of the room, but I guarantee someone from TPD was listening yes. in and taking notes. If there's a way you might be able to come together, create uh, maybe five subject areas to talk about, uh, you know, closing the streets, um, you know, youth, youth um, curfew, like some of the, the five main issues, maybe <coughs> three to five. And then then have let, let's let's go ahead and schedule that community conversation give the public the five topics and then just go down the list and let's let's brainstorm on street closures let's talk about all the stuff having to do with it and then let's talk about all the stuff having to do with and so and then have a second follow-up one where we can come up with some real plans anything we can do to encourage the community as a whole whether it be owners or uh, tenants or workers or uh, residents and their dogs to come out to do that i i think that the model that you've already created we don't have to create recreate a wheel so i would greatly appreciate it's, it's a great idea we're already on i've already met with two large groups and countless individuals and that feedback's already coming, and I think the opportunity when we're coming on your motion, Mr. Miranda, we could we could bring back some findings there. Yeah, yes, but the the big part, and I think the most important part, is that people want to be heard. So I think we can maybe uh, I'm thinking of bigger venues. At, I mean, several of the we, yeah. There's a we did a town hall forum in Ebor not too long ago and it was a church there which yeah. was a great I mean it's a walking distance from anybody that's there sure. we're all for having another one that one wasn't too long ago and we got some great feedback there yeah yeah I, like so I'm saying HCC I'm sure the Cuban Club might offer space and they have a really large theater so something like that where people can come and just have their voices heard I find that really is people just want to be heard and then we can kind of take it from there I know that you've already met with some groups and that's great but Really, being invited is is really important to people to get their message, to, to share what they want to share. I couldn't agree 100%. That's what we yeah. want is we want to be out there and we want to be approachable for people mm -hmm. to come to us with yeah. our input. So, so yes, I would love to work with you on that. Or if you come up with a date, please just you know keep us a part of every step of that because I think that will be something that we'll all want to go to. And if we know about it in advance, we can publicly notice it so that all of us can attend together. And that's, that's going to be a very important thing, that all of us can be there. Uh, so just enough time that we can publicly notice. Thank you. Councilman Vieira, Councilman Carlson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I wanted to thank Councilman Hertek for bringing that up because I was, which is uh, as well, which is there were a lot of good ideas that were talked about and, and they, they ought to be coming back to us because we you know, shouldn't leave here today, I think, without moving something forward. 
um, at least to investigate it, to date it, whatever you want to call it. For example, uh, the, the um, youth curfew issue was brought up, and we want to know the, the benefits of that, including from your officers, you know, the, the time that they're going to spend enforcing it, the, the detriment of it, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to make the motion uh, just because I didn't bring this issue up and I don't wish to intrude, um, but I, I do believe a motion should be made to have those proposals uh, that, that Councilwoman Hertak cited um, come back to us following that community input, because again, you know, we, we what happened over the weekend, I think, does place a duty on us to act. Uh, it does. It, it, I, I, I firmly believe that to act again with wisdom, to be judicious, uh, but to act with vigor and responsibility. I, I, I believe so. If someone wants to make that motion, I would December, love to December 21st is a good day because it doesn't well, have but, a lot of stuff. But, but again, to have that community conversation to begin with and then have a secondary conversation to winnow down, to talk about, I mean, we may be looking more at January, but it's also going to depend on when they can get space and the timing. So I, I don't disagree with you. I just don't know that emotion now, because I think the moving forward, we're, he's already started yeah. to plan that community yeah. conversation. Something to think about. Yeah. 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 So just briefly, yeah, we could either do either just have it somebody on somebody's internal clock or whatever to, to, to come back or make an, an, an aspirational motion for something in January if we have to move it back, whatever. Either way, but so long as it's coming back, I'm satisfied. Councilman yeah, Carlson. Yeah, the, the, in, in regard to motions, um, sometimes in situations like this, the public demands an immediate answer that will take away the tensions that are there. There's no new immediate answer that we can put in right now. The, there have been proposals that are made and for various reasons, we can't implement those immediately. But I want to let the public know, hopefully you have confidence in, in, the, in TPD and what they're doing, Tampa Fire Rescue. Uh, it's, the city is doing a lot uh, to work with Ebor and other neighborhoods. Um, we've, we've changed our philosophy to make sure we're focused on the whole city. In Ebor, um, <coughs> at city council, in regard to Ebor, we just had a discussion about parking lots two weeks ago. Uh, we're focusing CRA money to make things safer in Ebor. Um, investors are going in and rehabbing old buildings to make it safer and better. I mentioned the dog park, the arts. Um, there's, uh, the, um, there's an effort to potentially turn YCDC back into something like the West Shore Alliance or Downtown Partnership, which will further enhance clean teams and other things. There's two different, at least, proposals that were in place way before this to go before the legislature to ask for various kinds of help, including security. There are many, many things that are happening, and, and uh, you can see this city council and the city care about Ebor. We care about the residents and workers in Ebor, and we want to continue to help Ebor evolve, and we're going to be taking action, at, not just today, but every day, to make sure that Ebor is a, a safe and successful place that is respectful of the history and culture of Ebor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. We appreciate all your time and, and your hard work. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I'm going to give you a call. Make sure you're paid. It's, <laughs> I, we get paid Friday. It's fine. Um, item number six, Ms. Van Loan, I see you're here. This is um, regarding Mr. Urbanski. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Michelle Van Loan, Real Estate. Uh, a few weeks ago, I made the presentation uh, noting Mr. Urbanski's accomplishments and contributions to the community and showing you the location of the sign. At that time, I also noted that Mr. Urbanski does have a dog park named after him. Your ordinance 2023-63 does state that to be eligible, you cannot have another city asset named after you. However, it also states that if you do not meet the full eligibility, we have a process for that. So you also have attached the mayor's executive order approving on her side that this go through as an honorary street naming in addition to the dog park, which would then go hand in hand with the council ordinance if you so deem uh, appropriate. We also have, uh, as you go through this, we would ask that second reading be done on January 11th okay. as opposed to earlier because you have reached your five uh, honorary street naming limit for 2023. So this would be the first one that would be approved for 2024. Okay, uh, any questions or comments? Yes, sir. Um, I have to pull up an email I got. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, 
Um, where's my? I'm sorry. Go to, you want to go to somebody else first, and then? Uh, I'll just while you're looking for that, I'll just say uh, I'm glad that we're able to do this for a gentleman that, and I mentioned it earlier, his contributions to the city. There's so many stories going back to how the Buccaneers got here to uh, when he was with the newspaper with, I mean, on and on and on. But a very respected individual. I never met him. I don't know if Councilman Miranda, you did? Okay. Um, so I'm glad that we're, we're doing this. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, uh, DC uh, Gatufus, who um, I think helped initiate this, he emailed me, he said he's gonna come at second reading, it's still a second reading, right? But he wanted me to, he said, I don't need to be there if you can make sure there are gonna be uh, street name signs at Kennedy and Parker, Grand Central and Parker, and Brewing and Parker, is that? We have one street sign at one intersection right in front of, the request had been to have it in front of the former Tampa Tribune building. So it's right at the intersection at 202 South Parker, which is the street leading directly into uh, now the Arabella River Walk at the former Tampa Tribune. We haven't done any of them where it's been three different intersections. They've been at one major intersection closest to the site that was historically connected to them. Is it, po is it possible that if you have a conversation with him between now and the second reading, it changes? Can we... Can we just modify We can talk to him about that, yes. And then he said there's they, the family would like a bio sign, biography sign to be installed that they would pay for if, if you all allow it. So I'll let you talk to him. And um, do I have? Sorry, I should have asked. No, that's okay. <laughs> I just, with the ordinance and everything else, we haven't done that with everybody else. So if, I, I just worry about equity. So if we're going to do that, okay, would you for mind? some of them, I, I just want to be equitable to uh, everyone else. I'm, not, I'm just reading be. what he told me. So if okay. you don't mind, would you mind giving him a call uh, mm -hmm. tomorrow or something and, and just have that conversation with him and sort that out? And, I, and he said he'll be here and the family will be here next time. Um, but also, if you all it, saw in the packet, there's an executive order and there's an ordinance because this is, a, a, I think, a first kind of test of the system because, because uh, it didn't meet the criteria where we could vote on ourselves. There's also an executive order. And so I want to thank everybody for following that process. Um, be, uh, I think this is considered a major uh, sign besides the fact that he had something else. And so... Um, since it's at least because of it hitting the major category, it has to be approved by the mayor and city council, and that was part of the agreement that we came out with. So I want to thank everybody for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, who would like to read this? I'd like to read it, but I don't have a vice chair and I don't have a other chair, so. So Councilwoman council council Henderson. Okay. Thank you, Chair. File number HS23-84760, an ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, an ordinance of the City of Tampa, Florida, approving the placement of an honorary street naming sign at the southwest corner of South Parker Street and Grand Central Avenue in Tampa, Florida, to honor James F. Urbanski, providing an effective date. We have a motion from Councilwoman Henderson. Do we have a second? Second from Councilmember Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Second reading and adoption will be held on January 11th, 2024 at 9 a.m. And thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. Item number seven is going to be heard under staff reports. So now we're going to start with item number 61, which are public hearings. These are all quasi-judicial. If you are going to speak on any of the public hearings, Please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in by the clerk. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to provide is truth and nothing but truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will start with item number 61, which will be heard along with item number 70. Who is here to talk about item number 61? Is it you, sir? Come on up. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, good afternoon, Council. I was expecting staff to make an initial presentation, um, but they're not here. So uh, Clayton Bricklemeyer, Hillward Henderson, yeah. representing the applicant. Uh, we have made all the wait, changes. Wait, wait. Oh. What happened? They're online. They're yeah. oh. oh, sorry. Mr. Cotton is online. <laughs> yes, sir. All yes, right. Sir. Uh, he'll begin well, first. Actually, Mr. Cotton, um, go ahead. 
Thank you, Councilman. I'm going to actually turn it over to Sam Thomas to okay. do the second reading. I'm just here as moral support. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, Mr. Thomas. Go ahead, sir. Wait, 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 Council, were they Sam Thomas Development Coordination. Were this they... item is a rezoning request for the property located at 6713, 6715, and 6717 South Himes Avenue. Mr. Thomas, can you please raise your right hand so we swear you in? I don't think you are on camera. I'm sorry. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to provide is the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Sorry for the interruption. No worries. My apologies. Um, item number 61 is REZ 22103. This item is a rezoning request for the property located at 6713, 6715, and 6717 South Himes Avenue, and 6604, 6610, 6612, 6614, 6616, 6618, 6602, 6606, and 6600 South Sterling Avenue. The request is to rezone from RS60 to PD for residential single family <coughs> deeds attached. Certified plans have been submitted to the clerk's office and I'm available for any questions. Do we have any questions for Mr. Thomas? No, thank you very much, sir. Mr. Brickelmeyer. Uh, again, Clayton Brickelmeyer, uh, Hillward Anderson for the applicant. Uh, we've made all the requested changes and, and are happy and would ask for your support. Very good. Is there anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number 61? No one is registered. May I have a motion to close? So we have a motion to close from Council Member Vieira. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? Second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Councilwoman Hertek, would you mind reading item number 61? Sure. Thank you. File number REZ 22-103, ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption. An ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 6713, 6715, and 6717 South Times Avenue and 6604, 6610, 6612, 6614, 6616, 6618, 6602, 6606, and 6600 South Sterling Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification RS60 residential single family to PD plan development residential single family detached providing an effective date. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Council Member Vieira. Please record your vote. Motion carried unanimously with Clinton being absent. Thank you very much. Ms. Johns, are you taking number 70? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. This is in conjunction with 61. It's connected. Rebecca Johns, City Attorney's Office. This is the second public hearing for the development agreement. It goes in conjunction with the rezoning that you just approved. The site plan that was revised, I think, for the rezoning before the second reading <coughs> will be substituted in the development agreement for the site plan attached to the development agreement. Developer is here if you have any questions. Any questions? Do you have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item? No? Great name, Cigar City Builders. Very good. Uh, may I have a motion to close? We'll move. <laughs> motion from Council Member Miranda, second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Uh, who would like to move the resolution? So we'll move. We have, we're good. Council Member Miranda with the moving of the resolution. Second from Council Member Vieira. Please record your vote. Um? Oh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you very much, ma'am. Item number 62. Thank you, Thomas. Development coordination. Item number 62 is REZ 2354. This item is a rezoning request for the property located at 4307 West Fig Street. The request is to rezone from RS50 to RM18. I'm available for any questions. Any questions or comments for the gentleman? No? Do we have an applicant? Ma'am? No? Anybody here for item number 62? No. All right. The applicant are they, are they no. Hello? Yes, um, please turn hello? your camera on. Please turn your camera on. Um, my camera, it's, it, it went into a spin mode. <laughs> Do you have anything to add or no? Um, no, I'm just, so, my name is Soleng Yang. I'm actually a representative of the applicant. Um, okay. We, I'm just here for you have any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Because we can't see your, your face, we can't allow any of that as any testimony. Um, the rules are the rules for the virtual. So thank you very much. Do we have okay. any questions or comments from council members? No, did I ask if there was anybody in the public that wishes to speak for item number 62? Move close. We have a motion close from council member Miranda, second from councilwoman Henderson, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Council member 
Uh, Carlson. Yes. yes, sir. I'd like to move item number 62, file number REZ 23-54, ordinance being presented for second reading adoption, ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 4307 West Fig Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification RS50 single residential single family to RM18 residential multifamily providing effective date. Do we have a second? Second. Second from council member Miranda, please record your vote. Motion carried unanimously with Ken Bennett being absent. Thank you very much. Ma'am, if you're still on, um, your item passed, so you're good to go. Thank you very much. Item number 63. Sam Thomas, Development Coordination. Item number 63 is REZ 2369. This item is a rezoning request for the property located at 5301, 5212 West Tyson Avenue. The request is to rezone from PD and IH to PD for residential, multifamily, retail sales, and marina. Certified plans have been submitted to the clerk's office, and I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? Nope. Ms. Batzel, is this yours? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Uh, we just noticed the address was wrong, so we're just getting the correct address so you can read it into the record appropriately, but I, we don't have any comments. Do we need to modify? It says 5301 and 5212 West Tyson, but that's incorrect. Yes, the retail is correct. Kate Wells, Legal Department. I'm not sure how the address got incorrect on the agenda because the ordinance is correct. It's 5301 <laughs> and 5215 West Tyson Avenue. 5215, but yes. the ordinance is correct. Yes, sir. Is there any legal issue if we are to pass this and move forward because that ordinance is correct? It's just a, a just read And it was here. read correctly on first reading. Okay. So, I just read yeah. it with a correction. Though. So if we read it now, we just say 5215 West Tyson, yes, correct? Yes, please. All right. So Thank you. All right, any, um, yes, anything else, Ms. Batzel? No, yes, do we have anybody from the public that wishes to speak? We have a motion to from Councilwoman Henderson, second from Councilmember Miranda, all in favor? Aye. 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 Councilmember Miranda, if you would like to read this and remember, 5301 and 5215. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Ordinance uh, number 63, file number 23-69, ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption. Ordinance rezoning properties in the city 5301 and 5215 West Tyson Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one for zoning district classification, PD plan development, and IH heavy industrial, industrial heavy, and PD plan development, residential multifamily, retail sales, specialty goods, convenient goods, shopper goods, and marina, providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from council member Miranda, second from council member Vieira, please record your vote. Motion carried unanimously with Clint Bennett being absent. Thank you very much. Next is item number 64. Sam Thomas Development Coordination. Item number 64 is RAZ 2372. This item is a rezoning request for the property located at 2302 South Arowana Avenue. The request is to rezone from RM16 to PD for residential single family attached. Certified plans have been submitted to the clerk's office and I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions for the gentleman? No? Applicant, yes, sir. John LaRocca here for the applicant, Caramia Capital. Um, as Mr. Thomas indicated, we've uh, had the plant certified. We've made all the changes. We thank you for your consideration. Did you say Caramia Capital? Caramia Capital way. is the name of the owner. What a great name. Yes. As an Italian, I appreciate that. <laughs> Anybody in the public wish to speak on item number 64? No? All right. Anybody online? No? Can I get a motion closed? Motion closed from Councilmember Miranda. Second from Councilmember Vieira. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Councilmember Vieira? Yes, sir. Move an ordinance presented for second reading and adoption ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 2302 South Arowana Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification RM16 residential multifamily to PD plan development residential single family attached providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from Councilmember Vieira, second from Councilmember Miranda. Please record your vote. Motion carried unanimously with Clint Bannon being absent. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Item number 65. St. Thomas Development Coordination. Item number 65 is REZ 2375. 
This item is a rezoning request for the property located at 4914 South McDill Avenue and 3013 West Marlin Avenue. The request is to rezone from CG and RS75 to PD for a restaurant. Certified plans have been submitted to the clerk's office and I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? Do we have an applicant for item 65? Yes, ma'am. Yes, good afternoon, Addie Clark, 400 North Ashley Drive. As Sam mentioned, we made the revisions um, that were requested and we're here for any questions. Any questions or comments? Nope. Thank do you. We have, nope. Do we have anybody in the public, public that wishes to speak on item number 65? Do we have anybody registered? Is anybody registered for the rest of the cases? No? Motion to second. Councilman Henderson, second Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Councilwoman Henderson, would you mind reading 65? <coughs> Chair, can we move on? Yes. Yes. Councilwoman Hurtak. No problem. I've got gotcha. you. Um, so item number 65. File number REZ 23-70, an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption, an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 4914 South McDill Avenue and 3013 West Marlin Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section second. one from zoning district classification CG commercial general and RS 75 residential single family to PD plan development restaurant providing an effective date. We have a motion from Councilwoman Hurtak, second Councilmember Miranda, please record your vote. Motion carried unanimously with Clinton and being absent. Thank you very much. All right, item number 66, it shows that I was absent at the vote, but I did uh, look at the record, so I'm, I'm prepared to vote. I don't know about the other guy, but item number 66. Yes. Item number Wait. 66 is yes, REZ 2381. This item is a rezoning request for the property located at 2310 West Norfolk Street. The request is to rezone from CG and RS50 to RM24. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? Councilmember Vieira, it shows that you and I were absent at this vote. I looked at the record. Oh, yeah. You're good to go in 66? I am as good to go as you can get, surprisingly. Thank you very much, sir. Applicant, item 66. Hey, my name is Yuneski Hernandez. And I'm here for any questions. Any questions for the gentleman? Nope. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak for 66? I see no one. May I have a motion closed? Motion second. closed from Councilmember Miranda. Second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Councilwoman Henderson. Yes, thank you. File number, I move file number REZ 23-81. Ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption. And ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 2310 West Norfolk Street in the city of Tampa, Florida and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification CG commercial general to RS50 residential single family to RM24 residential multifamily providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from Councilwoman Henderson, second from Councilwoman Miranda, please record your vote. <coughs> motion carried unanimously with Clinton and being absent. Thank you very much. Item number 67, Mr. Thomas. <coughs> St. Thomas Development Coordination. Item number 67 is REZ 2385. This item is a request to rezone the property located at 4402 West Crest Avenue. The request is to rezone from IG to PD for all industrial uses. Certified plans have been submitted to the clerk's office and I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions or comments? No? Mr. Manassi. Good afternoon, Council. Ryan Manassi with Johnson Pope. I'm here for any questions and appreciate your approval. Any questions for the applicant? I see no one. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on this item 67? I see no one. May I have a motion to close? So move. Motion to close from Councilmember Miranda, second from Councilman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Councilmember Carlson, item number 67. Yes, sir. I'd like to move file number, or sorry, number 67, file number REZ 23 <coughs> 85, ordinance being presented for second reading adoption, ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 4402 West. Crest Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification, IG, industrial general to PD, plan development, all industrial general uses, providing effective date. We have a motion from council member Carlson, second council member Miranda, please record your vote. Motion carried unanimously with Clinton and being absent. All right, item number 68. We have an ordinance and we have the resolution. Who is Mr. Thomas, 68? Yes, sir. Sam Thomas, Development Coordination. Item number 68 is REZ 2387. This item is a rezoning request for the property located at 2709 North Tampa Street. The request is to rezone from RM16 to PD for residential single family attached and semi-detached. 
certified plans have been submitted to the clerk's office, and I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? No? Yes, sir, Mr. Manassi. Brian Manassi with Johnson Pope. I'm here for any questions. Any questions? Nope. Uh, anybody in the public wish to speak on item 68? Motion closed. Motion closed from Councilman Miranda. Second from Councilman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Councilmember Miranda. 68. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. File number 68, REZ 23-87. Order is being presented for second reading and adoption. An ordinance rezoning property in general vicinity of 2709. North Tampa Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification, RM16 residential multifamily to PD, plan development, residential single family attached and semi-detached, providing an effective date. We have a motion from Councilmember Miranda. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilmember Vieira. Please record your vote. Motion carried unanimously. Move the resolution. Motion carried unanimously with Clinton and being asked. Thank you very much. Councilman Moran has made a motion to move the resolution that is attached to 68. Second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. We now move into staff reports. Uh, the staff reports are uh, beginning with 72. However, 74 will be heard with item number 26 by request, and item <coughs> number 7 will come at the end of staff reports. That was already pulled earlier. So we're going to begin with item number 72. Mr. Baird, yes, sir. Brad Baird, um, Deputy Administrator of Infrastructure. I'm here for uh, the McKay Bay Waste Energy Facility Improvements Project. And a um, reminder that uh, this item is in front of the City Council for the second time, and this time for approval. Um, and then behind me, we have the key members of the Waste Energy team to answer questions at the end. Um, so with that, if I could have the presentation pulled up, please. Yes, sir. We see it here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, okay. Let me start with uh, the project highlights or the or the main main parts of this project, and I won't go down uh, the entire list. Uh, but I'll hit the main ones, uh, most of which are labeled uh, on the uh, aerial. Uh, the uh, first and main one, the primary reason we are, are uh, doing this project is the turbine generator refurbishment. Secondly, uh, the upgrade, upgrade the control system for the entire facility. Uh, the boiler water wall replacement, or at least a portion thereof. Replace natural gas burners and piping. Replace main condenser, cooling tower, and cir circulating water piping. Replace both re refuse cranes. Replace the entire ash building. Replace and relocate 13.8 um, uh, kilovolt and uh, 4160 volt switch gear and replace the 480 volt switch gear. Um, stack repairs. Replace main and auxiliary transformers. Um, with that, I'll go into the timeline. Most of the work I mentioned occurs during a 10-week period uh, next year. I'll go into uh, details into that timeline. Uh, starting out with the current month, we have already started pre-outage construction activities for the turbine generator building extension, as well as the circulating water pipe bridge which is a pretty significant um, structure to support the above ground circulating pipe. I'm sorry? No, no, that was just a computer sound. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, then uh, next, Larry's team will begin uh, waste diversion in late January, a couple weeks ahead of the outage so we can get that tipping floor cleaned up and the plant ready for the outage. Um, February 15th, 2024 is the official start date of the outage and the shutdown of the facility. Um, during that time, during the outage time, we, we will be reducing early morning and late evenings uh, scale house hours um, to the public uh, due to these site activities. Uh, there may be minor delays in garbage pickup as trucks perform longer routes. Um, to haul to the Hillsborough County landfill, and this again is throughout the outage. Um, then uh, May 1st, 2023, will uh, be the completion of the outage. And then uh, mid-May, 
the Department of Solid Waste will stop diverting waste uh, to the county landfill as we ramp up to full operations. All of this will be extensively communicated to the public using a variety of methods as brought up by um, Councilwoman Hertak. And then finally, uh, two, years, two years out, um, we will be um, installing the main and auxiliary transformers in the 480 switchgear due to the, the uh, delay in ordering that equipment. Um, so that was planned quite a few months ago. We saw we were gonna have that delay. It will be a very minor outage. We're talking days, not 10 weeks. With that, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so this is uh, the project financial impacts. Um, with, uh, as I said last time, GMP one, two, and three total up to $99.9 .9 million. Um, GMP-1 was paid out of Solid Waste Department reserves or cash. GMP-2 and 3 will be covered via short-term financing. Um, future uh, Solid Waste bond issuance will be necessary to cover costs uh, long-term. And um, that at some point uh, there will be a potential rate increase that will have to come back to City Council to cover uh, uh, the costs of GMP-2 and 3. Um, and then uh, on the right hand side of the slide, I want to talk about uh, project impacts. Can we mute whoever that is? Yeah, someone's yeah. playing video games online and we're hearing the noise. So they're getting emails. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if oh, we can mute that. So that you would... want me to talk through the video games? Or... <laughs> the Russians are coming. Sorry, Brett. <laughs> All right. We'll continue through. I'm almost, I'm almost finished and then we can go to questions. All right. Um, the uh, average additional uh, cost impact or summarized as follows. The hauling costs are $107,000 per diversion day. Um, and lost electrical revenues are $42,000 a day or almost $150,000 a day. Um, so using those numbers and some extensive um, calculations that uh, Dennis and his team have done over the next uh, over the last two two weeks, uh, results in the project paying for itself in 5.7 years, um, which um, we we feel is very favorable for uh, public sector ROI. And then uh, finally, 90 days of diversion uh, will total a cost of $13.5 million. And um, I'll stop there and uh, answer questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Baird. Um, I, I spoke last time um, about the importance of the waste energy facility, obviously, and the necessary improvements as we've discussed. Uh, I think most of us, many of us have taken a, a tour. If, if anyone has not I highly encourage it and recommend it I know solid waste isn't the most attractive thing but it's a necessity when you're running a city any city and of this capacity especially but it's so fascinating to see I was so impressed at how it all happens because it's what we don't see you know we, we take it to the dumpster or the trash gets picked up and we don't know the, the men and women that, that make it happen and how it happens however I saw where the need for improvement and repairs and the investment were and what happens if we don't make those investments and what it's gonna cost us if we don't make those investments. So again, um, probably the most impressive facility that the city has. And, um, and thank you for this presentation and I'm happy to support this. Councilwoman Hertha, Council Member Carlson. Thank you. Uh, thank you again for this presentation. We have been working on this for a long time. If you don't mind going back uh, on to the to the timeline because it sure. says 90 days of diversion but if you're starting to begin waste diversion in late January and you're stopping waste diversion on May 13th to me that's four and a half months not 90 days that's 135 days no that um, the diversion I'm sorry the outage is expected to be about 75 days so then two additional weeks would put that at 89 or, or, or 90. We rounded up to 90 for the diversion. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and so then go forward to how much money it's going to cost to divert. Okay. I think it's 90. Or no, 13, oh, yeah. 13 and a half million dollars. Now, 
Yeah, we've got to fix that. Whoever's um, online, please mute yourself. I, I don't know who. Um, oh, it's no. Oh, it's CCTV. Oh. Okay. Oh. Well, Hopefully they can figure it out. They're good at That's that. Even worse. Um, <laughs> uh, but thirteen and a half million dollars is a lot of money, specifically for diversion over ninety days. Yes. Uh, this might be a really good chance for people to try once a week garbage uh, drop off because if there are few fewer cans out there, it's less time for uh, the the garbage pickup crew to have to go back out to the um to the to the dump basically so yeah. to the landfill so i don't know just want to encourage people to give that a whirl during this time yeah maybe we can help include that in our messaging yeah. you know yeah yeah maybe so. just make sure you have it on your main day and then then if you really don't need it don't put it out uh because it will save uh, oh, thank you it will save the um Basically, it'll save the costs that will come from the increase that we're expecting yep. Thank further you. down the road. Thank you. Carlson and then Miranda. Um, when I look at, you and I have had this, Brad, you and I have had this, or Ms. Baird, you and I have had this conversation before. When I look at something like this, I look at it as, uh, we might call it an enterprise, I look at it as, a, as, as if it was a, how it would be measured in the private sector, how private sector would make decisions. And um, the, so the, the total cost right now you're estimating is 100 million, just under $100 million. Um, the, if I remember correctly, the report that we got when this, was, the, this facility was analyzed two or three years ago was something like $62 million. Can you I don't, it, tell me if that number is correct or not, but can you just tell us what the difference is between what was originally estimated by the consultants two or three years ago and what you're proposing spending now and and what the why there is a difference in what it's paying for yes sure absolutely um and i think i covered a little bit of this i'll try to do a little bit more this time but um uh the um the 10-year capital improvement plan that uh, was prepared in 2018 um uh, some, most of everything in the first five years was condensed into the into the one project. Um, you know, since that time, we have had um, the pandemic, and we've had um, uh, you know lead lead time delays, both of which have leaded led to excuse me uh, cost increases. We're seeing that across the board in you know, all of our uh, construction projects. Um, also, we did have some scope change, and I think last time I used the example of the ash building. The ash building, originally we thought we could repair it. Um, upon further inspection uh, since 2018, um, it, was, it was apparent that uh, it was beyond repair, and we had to replace the entire building. Um, they, you know, we have put in also some additional contingencies when we open up that turbine generator, um, we want to make sure, you know, we don't know what we're going to find. It was supposed to be opened up every five years. We're right at nine years right now. So we put some extra contingency in for that. Those are two examples, um, but it's a combination of those two things. And do you expect, over the next five years, do you expect more than this, or is it, do you think we're good for five years or so now with this amount? Um, I, I think, um, you know, based on the remainder of, of the 10-year uh, plan, it would be less than what we're spending here on this design-build effort. Um, so I think we'll be in much better shape, uh, you know, come uh, late spring next year, and um, we'll be able to spread out that work uh, better. You know, uh, by condensing it, we were able to do all this work in one big outage, and that's a big deal because it's a lot of coordination. Um, but I think it will, in the long run, um, help us to even out that cost. So, uh, uh, Ms. Rojero, just a quick question. The other day we were talking about bonding costs. Um, are you going to bond all $100 million or are you only bonding 64 And And based on the numbers we heard the other day, it's the bond cost is something around 90%, right? So if it was $100 million, we would be paying about $90 million in interest or 
or what, what's the amount that we would be bonding and how much do you think the interest would be? Yes, sir. Uh, no, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And further to um, the previous discussion uh, that just occurred, we would not bond anything more than we think we'll need, okay? Our worst case scenario right now, or our most expensive <coughs> case scenario right now, is a $120 million bond. And as you said, that'd be about another $100 million with interest. <coughs> Uh, of interest, excuse me, for about you know two hundred and twenty million dollars. It's a it's an expensive project, but, and I think Mr. Baird mentioned this. We will begin with short term issuances, and as we get a better feel for what the total cost will be, that's when we would roll it all up into a bond, and we wouldn't borrow any more than we anticipate. So, do you know? Uh, and I kind of asked this the last time, but do you know what the business model would look like now? I think in terms of P and L sheets, but. Um, so if we had $100 million in equity they were investing in the private sector, you would amortize that, and then you would, you would also apply whatever the interest is, uh, $90 million over, over 30 years, and then, and then you would um, add in the O&M costs, and then you would deduct the $8 million or whatever that we're selling. Um, I'm, I'm just curious to see how, what, what the net impact is on our, um, on our operating month-to-month uh, -month expenses. Mm -hmm considering if you added in the capital costs and the, and the interest. No, I, I appreciate that. We have what I will call a hybrid. The difficulty from our perspective with a 30-year profit and loss projection is the contract for the sale of electricity ends relatively soon. And we don't feel, uh, we don't feel enough of an expert to carry what would happen after that. We could go with the same provider. We could go with a different provider, and the revenues would vary. So again, that would impact the profit projections, but we do have the cost projections and we have, uh, if I could start small and then work my way up, the, the business case that you've mentioned in terms of the city doing it versus the private sector doing it. If I can have the Elmo up, please. Yes. the overhead projector activated there we go thank you thank you very much and you see here again this is last year 2023 I'm going to show you 2023 and 2025 because 2024 is is going to be a little chaotic for the reasons that we've already talked about but you see here and I don't know if Mr. Baird mentioned it or not but one of the things we've talked about often especially in the last two weeks as we've worked to refine these figures is you don't run a waste to energy plant to, to make a profit, okay? Uh, the experts will tell you no waste to energy plant out there makes a profit. Uh, that's why it's, it's such, a, such an interesting question when the question is, well, does the waste to energy facility make money? Depends on how you define making money. Does it net positive? Not by any means, and I'm about to show you that. But it brings in significant revenue to offset its cost. So we want to race, run a waste to energy facility, as you know, mitigate impact to the environment. And as you'll see here, because doing something else would cost a great deal more money. So uh, at the top here, here's the running the waste to energy facility and not running the waste to energy facility. You see here, we're bringing in, again, a significant amount of revenue, over $15 million. That's, that's fantastic. But it cost us last year about double that to run the place. Was it, 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 I remembered a number like eight or nine million. Was it, was the revenue especially high last year? It was, yes. No, no, what caused memory. that yes. to go up? It was especially, it was especially I, I don't know, maybe one of the experts knows why it went up particularly. And while he's walking up, just yes. to, from my perspective, no, I, I don't think anybody expects a, a government uh, service like this to make profit in this kind of way. Mm -hmm. But when you compare it to the alternative, which you've done there, or yes. if you compared it to what you would have to pay the private sector, yes. if, if this was run as a private sector organization, you would have to charge, um, you would have to charge $14 million more at least yeah, basically to double. charge for that. And so yeah. the way, the way you com compare to see if you're staying in line is to compare to what the alternatives would be, which we don't want for environmental reasons or, how much would the private sector cost? And, and it's just so we can keep ourselves, uh, so that we can let the public know that we're monitoring it. Yes, well, well framed. So. Uh, Council, I'm Michael Deloach with Arcadis with a consulting engineer uh, for the city over in McKay Bay. So <clears throat> the energy cost and revenues in, in this particular contract, the power purchase agreement with Seminole Electric uh, is 
tied to a fuel escalator uh, that compares against natural gas. Uh, most power purchase agreements are not, but Seminole made a bet when they signed this agreement with us to, that fuel costs would go down and not up, and they went up. So uh, at the moment, our revenues for the power purchase agreement are, are high, and they are much higher, uh, Councilman Carson, than they were previously. It is much more likely that as we have to sign a new PPA, as this one expires uh, several years out, that we will get significantly less revenue. And with the forward. fuel changes, it'll be a lot less next year, right? It, it's already come back down even, yeah. uh, we were just looking at the numbers uh, within the last couple months, as, since fuel's variable. So it dropped, had a big drop recently in natural gas prices, so our revenues have come down a little bit for the last month or so. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Councilmember Miranda. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm fine. Oh. You're good, you good oh. Councilman? Oh, I, I just didn't know if you had further questions. Oh, Anything I, else? I, I defer to the chair. I apologize. I can ask other questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Would anyone like to move this resolution? I'll move it. Second. Council Member Miranda has moved. Item number 72. Second from Council Member Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council. Council Member yeah. Vieira, this is your motion, but yeah. I would like. I was going to continue it. Oh, oh. Yeah, I, so if I'm, you were, you were going to. No, no, yeah. go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, yeah, no, for 73, staff met with the Hive. The Hive was here um, to talk, and obviously we had a, a, a packed agenda today. Um, so um, everything appears to be moving forward. So what I'll do is uh, uh, motion to continue this to um, January. Let's just do the um, first week of January, if I may. What is it, the 10th? 11th. 11th. All right, Councilman, uh, Councilman Vieira with the motion to continue 73 Sorry. to January 11th under staff reports. <coughs> Uh, second from Councilman Miranda, all in favor? Aye. 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 Councilman Hertek, were you stepping out? Oh, I was just going to, yeah, but I, I want to be here. Please. Okay, item number 74. Councilman Vieira, I'm just going to use the oh, restroom yes, if I can sir. hand it to you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. I'll be right back. Okay. 74. Who is here from staff for 74? And Kelly, if I could have Ms. Scharf come out too, thanks. Did you wish to, uh, Councilman Hertek, you want to preview, the, is this? Yes. Did you want to, if you went, you may. Well, the reason, I just wanted to say that uh, I added <coughs> number 26 onto this as well, because they just went so well together. Mm -hmm. 26, I'm just gonna kind of read out loud. We are um, moving, over half a million dollars for credit card fees for the water department alone. And during our budgetary process, we talked about possibly moving the credit card fees on to the consumer because one way or the other, the consumer does pay it. If they're not paying it in the individual, they're certainly paying it with their taxes. So um, enabling us to, to use that money for more things. And that is, I believe, what Mr. Rohero is here to speak about today. Yes, ma'am. Um, your memo was really, really wonderful. And I'd just like to, uh, I Thank said you. that to you privately, but I also just wanted to say it publicly, how, how clear it was. Very kind. And I just want to appreciate, just say how much I appreciated it. Thank you. Sir? Well, again, we've uh, thank you again for the compliment, ma'am, and we've provided that staff report. Uh, we've also provided a, um, additional information, a little bit of historical information. We, uh, the city has looked at this over the years, uh, different times, and we've stated some of the complexities and some of the questions that have surfaced when we've talked about it. Uh, there, are, there have been questions about equitability. There have been uh, questions about uh, you know, being perceived as increasing fees, if you will. But, again, as the staff report indicates, there's a significant amount of credit card fees that the city absorbs in lieu of passing on to the customer. And I provi provided some information in the staff report, but I would like to share with you, again, if, if we can go to the ELMO, the overwhelming majority of these charges you see here, again, the gorilla in the room is Tampa Online Utilities. Mm -hmm. and, and to frame it, as is in the staff report last year, there were four and a half million dollar credit card transactions charging over $200 million. And as I believe, as uh, Councilwoman Hertak mentioned, the city absorbed uh, four and a half million dollars of that. So uh, if I could just run through these real, uh, 
real quick, Tampa Online Utilities, Construction Services, Parking, Parks and Recreation, speaking of uh, the Waste Energy Facility, Solid Waste, McKay Bay, and the Tampa Convention Center. I don't think these are a big surprise to anybody, but one of, again, one of the concerns that has surfaced in the past is an adverse impact on business to the Tampa, uh, to the, uh, Tampa Convention Center because that is the preferred, uh, by, a, by a, a, a big margin, that's the preferred method of payment for the Tampa Convention Center. So having, I'll leave that up in case we want to reference it again. If council would like to pursue this, uh, we referenced it briefly in the staff report. We've got three, obviously, the big three primary credit card providers, American Express, MasterCard, and Visa, and they each have different rules. Many of them are consistent. Many of them are not. So if council would like to pursue it, we can work with our uh, merchant services provider that is, eh, for lack of a better word, is our liaison with those credit card companies and, and start threading the needle as to how we could implement either a fixed charge per transaction or a percent percentage charge per transaction. And uh, in uh, the available potential fees we identify in the staff report, I think makes a clear case that the service fee would be the way, the way to go. It's a, it's a much simpler format to charge as opposed to a convenience fee. Uh, having said that, we're open to additional uh, questions. Councilwoman Hertak, Councilman uh, Carlson. Uh, thank you. And yes, again, I really, uh, one of my favorite parts is the comparison to other jurisdictions. Do you mm -hmm. possibly have that <coughs> visual? Uh, yes. I'll oh, just, awesome. I'll put it on the, uh, just because I, I think, again, we all read the staff report, but for the public that didn't, mm -hmm hop on sire just showing what's been what's being done everywhere else mm -hmm. and that we are not doing any of it uh, and I'm shocked I mean looking at Jacksonville like um, you know nine dollars and 95 cents I mean can that's that's significant so mm -hmm. so we have room to grow we can we can pretty much do do anything and I again I just wanted to show people what's happening elsewhere so that when we start looking at this possibility, what we're doing, uh, we've also heard very clearly from the public that they want as much possible money to be spent on public, the public good, and that four and a half million dollars can go very far. So, I, I think service fee is seems to make I agree a. a a better choice, but I would also really love to hear what other people have to say. And if, if I may point out further to your point, ma'am, Jacksonville is an interesting scenario because it appears to address some of those concerns about equitability. It's a tiered program wherein if you have a higher charge, you're, you're charged a higher mm -hmm. amount. So try, it looked like they were trying to keep the proportions a yeah, little more, very, uh, yeah, more equitable. A little more equitable. So, so, but that's what I'm saying. I really love the, the ability to, to look at the different changes because just the flat of Tallahassee of $5 for every single charge, that's crazy. We don't need that. But how do we find that nice balance? It seems like a lot of people are in the $2 range, but, but how do we not pay for the full amount? So, you know, how do, mm -hmm. how do we make it equitable? Um, that also brings the question of maybe folks who are already receiving help. I don't know if they pay by credit card, but if folks are already receiving help for some of these bills, maybe that would be um, a cost that could be borne by the city, but a much smaller cost. So that's, uh, yeah, I think that's a, a very good point. Some, some sort of hardship program, yes, perhaps yes. like we, we do with our other fees. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Councilman Carlson and Councilman Miranda. Anderson. Yeah, the, the, th the thing about this is that um, it is a cost, a direct cost to the city, and it's a it's a cost that's made per transaction, and so it's directly tied to users. And what's happening now is that the rest of the city is um, is paying for it. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's not using a credit card is is subsidizing everybody else who is, and. It, it seems like it's just not fair. And I think, I don't have the sheet in front of me, but I think it's about $4 million a year or so that we're four and a half million. Yes, that, four and a half last year. So that's, that is more than, than the uh, road repair budget last year mm -hmm. and almost mm -hmm. as much as the, um, the uh, parks repair budget. And 
and uh, it, it makes sense to recoup this. Um, as I recall, how long ago, have, were you here in the Greco administration, either one of you? Not as I recall, back in the Greco administration, that was when websites first started, and the city did a deal with a private vendor because it was very expensive back then to create websites. Mm -hmm. And they did a deal with a private vendor with the vendor. The reason why we have the tampagov.net, Charlie may remember this, is because uh, it was, the website was done by a private vendor and that's why it couldn't be .gov at that time. This is back in the 90s. Oh. And, um, and the private company built the website, I think for free, but they made a fee per transaction. And they, so they covered their costs of the credit cards, but then they charged, marked it up. So my point is that, uh, and, and now in the last couple of years, we've, the, it, it appears to me because we've gone to .gov that the city controls its own website now. But um, it, my point is that as far as I can remember, there was a time, it maybe at least 10 years, where the city was charging a fee just because the private vendor was charging a fee. And so at some point we stopped. Do you, does anybody remember any of that? I don't remember. I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying you're incorrect. I just, I just. Yeah, it was just. It was a way of buying an expensive website uh, on a on a transaction basis. Um, the the credit card companies they charge us a percentage, right? Like two and a half or three percent. Yes, uh, so, I think Mastercard and Visa are the same, and then American Express is slightly higher. So if it's if somebody buys something that's ten dollars, and you say this kind of in your report, but if they buy something for ten dollars, then a two dollar fee sounds high and percentage would be better but if they pay a thousand dollars then two is a subsidy so if you do you think net if we charge two dollars per transaction it it we would at least break even or it it's based on i'm sorry if i can refer to my memo based on the number of transactions it's i think there were about four million it, four it, million transactions it's, yes, uh, yeah, four, so four and a half million transactions at which, and coincidentally four and a half million dollars in fees so it appears like from from my perspective, you got to start someplace, right? Um, so we charge it's $1, two dollars, two dollars. You know. Sorry, cut you off. so if we're four and a half million transactions, four and a half million dollars, mm -hmm. if we charge two dollars, we'd have about eight million dollars in in revenues. Yes, sir. Now, that you might look at that and say, well, four, eight minus four and a half, we'd have three and a half million in new money. But technically, we have eight million dollars in new money because it, the the general fund is subsidizing these fees. And so my next my next question, my next question is, um, where, um, if if the general fund is subsidizing these fees, then if if we have the users pay for them, then <coughs> the eight million dollars would be in the general fund, and then we could reallocate it to to road repair or something like that. Correct. That's, that's partially correct. For instance, uh, yes, the general fund is subsidizing some of these for the general <coughs> fund departments. A water department, for instance, the water. Uh, wa water rates would be subsidizing that particular fee, but we can we can break it out by you know uh, enterprise fund, general fund. So yes, it, it, I anticipate a significant amount would still be available for the general fund, but not in its entirety. Yeah, my 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 final point is just as as we get that schedule of how much the money would be, <coughs> I think we need to have a meeting like we had on the budget and figure out how to allocate it. Um, we were able to increase the road repair budget, but it, it is in terrible need, we're never gonna get the public to agree to trans transit solutions if we can't even repair the roads first. So um, I would advocate for that. Councilmember Miranda, Councilwoman Henderson. Thank you, I, I, you're absolutely correct. All three of those credit card companies have different uh, rates. The highest, uh, if I remember when I was in the restaurant business was American Express. They were like a half a point or a little less than half a point more than the others. And I refused to use American Express. They didn't like it, too bad. <laughs> But that was the first five years after that, we came to a compromise and we worked it out. But it, uh, it, uh, it's, good yes. it's uh, very nice that they brought this up. The council of Matthew Hurtank is the one that brought it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it would, it would uh, give us additional funds and I think we ought to allocate it to what we need the most. And that is nothing more but roads and pave and roads and pave and pave the road. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a tough go. But we'll get there. Some of the roads are being paved. I get, I'm sure all of you received in your emails. Some section of people or city has done, some section somewhere else is done. And so they're working a section at a time. And when that's done, it'll be complete. But it's getting a little bit more difficult because we're already tearing up roads with a pipe program. We can't replace those until those are finished. Right. So it's, it's a give and take, and I hope the public understands that. Chairman, I have to be somewhere at 430. Don't worry. It's okay. Thank Councilwoman Henderson. Thank you, Chair. 
want to ask you, I, I, I don't like paying additional fees. And I remember when um, the city of Tampa water bill was the only one that I was writing the check for because you didn't have an online payment system mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Camp, is, you know the option where you're allowed to put in your routing number and your checking account number? Mm -hmm. um, that's not of, of any cost to the consumer or to us when that's done, right? Now that I would refer to Mr. Baird that's for, the for that. ACH, that's, ACH. that's exactly yeah. what it's called. Automatic clearing house. Yes, uh, Brad Baird, Deputy Administrator <laughs> of Infrastructure. That is correct, Councilwoman. Yeah, so why don't we have that option um, available to us when it comes to paying our water bill? Because I, I will go back to writing the check. Because how much is a stamp now? No, we do have that option. No. We, mm -hmm. we do currently have that option. I know. The ACH can be put in. I don't see that option there. Y yes, it, it is only... in there. Let me get with you Go offline ahead. and we can walk you through that. Under um, on tampagov.net for our utility bills? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Really? Put your check in, right? Oh, I'm going to do it. Payment. Yes. And save that fee. Okay, but isn't that a, is that a fee for us? Is Or is it free? No, it's free. To the public, okay. But so, isn't it yeah, fair we, to at least inform the public that there is an option, an electronic option that is of no cost to you? Yes, and, and we we do, and that's on there, and we will. Uh, I will have somebody get with you, and we can walk that walk you through that. Everybody and, needs to know that. I'm just. And if and if I may, if I may, thanks, Brett. Yeah. Thank you very much. And if I may add, should yeah. we should we choose should council choose to go forward with this? Mm -hmm. I, I would highly suggest we, we include that as part of the messaging. There are, there yeah. are other options. And uh, I think further to a, a previous point you made, uh, we, we say it in the staff report, but I think it's worth reiterating, the number of transactions and the number of customers that are using credit cards have only increased, and we don't anticipate they're going to decrease. It's that more and more people are going with, uh, with the card. And customers and businesses are, are going with the card. Thank you very much. Much yes, ma'am, Councilwoman Hurtak. So where where do we go next? Do you need a motion? Like, from what us? do we do next? Do you... <laughs> it's a staff. I don't know that a motion is necessary, yeah. but it seems like it's the will of council to yeah. proceed. So yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I just I'll just tell you we'll proceed with it and bring you back. Well, we'll bring we'll bring you back any any level of detailed information. But what I suggest is you give us the direction that you'd like to go this route, and we'll come back with a report that identifies some of the details specific, for instance, to each credit card company mm -hmm. and the logistics that we'd have to implement or that we'd have to put How much time uh, forward do you to implement. Need? 24 needs an approval. I'm sorry? Oh, oh, thank yeah. you. Uh, item number yeah. 24 yes, does yes, need yes, an approval. We, yeah, thank, 26. Thank you, we will approve that, I yeah. promise. But yeah. I would like to see, look, to, to look at the Jacksonville system. Okay. Of the of the tier, uh, I think we could hit a, a a majority of our residential folks with that with a, that lower rate, and then go up from there. Uh, but basic, but the service fee uh, you recommended that yes, I I think we can go with that recommendation. But to to look at the possibility for a tier, and just to to remind, um, can you just put that back up on the Elmo super fast so people can yes, see absolutely. just what we're talking about in, in terms of tier. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's, you know, $2.20 up to $500 bill, $4.40 for 501 to, to 1000 and nine ninety five for over 1000 And that, obviously our numbers might be different, but just I think <coughs> Me personally, I would like to see that option. I can't speak for others. I'd like to see it too, and that would be uh, what I suggest is that would be one of okay. the formats that we would provide to you, along with a breakdown, as uh, Councilman Carl said, of, of the particular fund type impact, general oh, fund, right. enterprise fund, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So the consensus is there, but we need to move item number 26, which is Councilwoman Hurtak. So uh, I'll move item number 26. We have a motion from Councilwoman Hurtak. Second. Do we have a second? Second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? And yes, ma'am. And then I will make a motion when <coughs> when do you feel comfortable coming back? And again, as always, you can you can tell my office you want later and we'll move it if you need to. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, can we say what's what's uh, early November? A month? Oh really? Wow, okay. Uh, so December seventh. 
Um, how about, how about, uh, we don't have anything on the 21st. Wiser people are recommending I go after the holidays. Oh, okay. <laughs> January 11th. Yeah. We, yes, we okay. have a very it's low right. council session on the 21st, but we've, we've added a bunch of stuff to the 11th. But yeah, let's, let's do the 11th, uh, January 11th, January. Uh, 2024, we under staff motion reports. Motion from Councilwoman Hurtak. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilmember Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Councilman. Yes, sir, Councilman Carlson. Uh, Thanks. Yes, one, one more thing. Um, when you when you come back, could you please? I didn't put it in the motion, but could you just make a note to look and see uh, if the city charged these fees before, or or that third party vendor, and and when we stop? Because I, I think we just changed the website in the last two or three years, <coughs> maybe from that other vendor. And so if it if we were charging recently and it just dropped through the cracks somehow, I don't know if somebody made an intentional decision or if it just was a something that was missed in switching over just so we can tell the public that uh, that that it was charged before and if it wasn't then then that's the answer but if um, if most cities charge it it's not fair for other people to subsidize it and um, and if we charged it before until a couple years ago whatever it was then then those are pretty good reasons to do it thank you yes sir we'll find out thank you very much sir next up we have item number 75 which is a motion by council member Vieira regarding Special needs internship. If I may, just yes, briefly, and this shouldn't take too long. And, and Miss Wynn, thank you for all your help. I think we've had to continue this one a few times. So thank you for all your help and patience. So I, I, I had put money in the budget uh, for uh, a six-figure paid special needs internship uh, where we can have uh, 10, 11, 12, whatever the number may be, interns um, here paid $15 an hour. Uh, people with autism, intellectual disabilities, et cetera, uh, working in different departments, including city council for the city of Tampa. Um, and, and it looks like uh, this is uh, uh, getting some lift off. And I know we've been working with, I believe, McDonald's Training Center and Pepin Academy. So, Yes, sir. That's exactly right. OCA Wynn, Administrator of Neighborhood and Community Affairs. And I'm happy to stand before you to provide an update. And in addition to Pepin McDonald Training Center, we're also working with the GROW Group. Um, for this internship program. Um, what we're doing is that we um, have identified uh, those three areas as uh, primarily as, I would say, a pilot program, <coughs> excuse me, for the internship program before embarking upon a full-blown program. Um, the purpose of that is to identify benchmarking, key things that work, what, did, what didn't work, how we need to improve amongst ourselves since this is the first time we're working in this space. Um, each of the nonprofits have received MOUs, which they're currently reviewing, and after that review, we'll be ready to move toward the next steps. Um, those next steps would include uh, site visits within, city of our, within the city uh, locations so that we can, uh, or the students or the, the employees, future employees, could uh, understand what areas work with them or where they're comfortable with working within. Um, as you said, Council Member uh, Vieira, we are, will be able to provide a $15, hour, $15 an hour internship for about 12 to 15 people. Ultimately, what we hope for is self-sustainability. So this program we see as a leg into working with career source for a long-term self-sustainable program um, that we would continue to partner with all of these agencies on. And if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes. So a couple of things, and thank you for that. So just to be, I know we, we've spoken about this, I wanna make sure we're on the same page because you talk about a, um, a test pilot program. So yes, these interns, would be working in the city of Tampa government. Correct? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. be, we've identified opportunities within parks and recreation, mm -hmm. within city offices. Great. So mm -hmm. you mentioned city council, but any of the city yep. offices, yep. and within uh, TNI as well, within our technology area mm -hmm. as well. So the pilot again is to see what works, what doesn't work, how do we need to alter our processes to accommodate. So mm -hmm. yes, sir. And thank you for that. Um, and, and let me ask you, uh, we're talking about about a dozen folks. I think the budget in this was about 150,000, 100,000, as I recall. Um, we, we got in 
Um, when do you think we're actually going to be beginning this, roughly? Well, when, as soon as we get that, we're waiting on them to return those MOUs, those agreements. Mm -hmm. And once we get those agreements back, we'll be ready to launch. Okay. We've already identified the opportunities. Okay, great. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, I'll motion to just have this. I, I always, whenever I do things like this, I always like to have them come back just for reminders because, you know, uh, in, in council, it, uh, yeah, we always need that. But if no one else has anything. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's just for the summer? Or no, all year round? It's year round. Okay. Good. At how many hours per student? Per 20 hours a week. Yeah. We're looking at about 20 hours a week for, for about 16 weeks. So that gives us two semesters. Will um, they receive benefits? No. Okay. What, no, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. Anybody else? Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councilman Beard, do you have a follow-up motion? For yeah, sure, if I may. Office? Yeah, and, and with benefits, I, I would think the vast majority of those folks have Medicaid or Medicare mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. um, through Social Security. Um, but, yeah, so let me just, um, uh, as a follow-up on this, and, and what the heck, January 11th. And, again, the follow-up shouldn't take more than this. We have a motion from Councilmember Vieira for a staff report January 11th, 2024. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. And, and, and if I may, thank you, Ms. Winnigan, for all your hard work, because we, you're wearing a lot of different hats, so we appreciate that. Well, you're more than welcome. I'm mm -hmm. glad to get this launched. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Item number 76, there is a PowerPoint that was previously submitted back on October 3rd with a memo. We have Mr. Javier Marin, our <coughs> Economic Opportunity Director, and other community members or other team members here to discuss this. The uh, PowerPoint is up on our screen. Let's get it up on the main screen and you can begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Council. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, for the record, Javier Marin, Economic De uh, Opportunity Director. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to visit with you today. Uh, some of the items we're gonna be discussing today uh, 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 are in regards to uh, opportunities that we're developing internally to support localized retail options in our most needed communities. To that end, uh, we have partnered with uh, the CRA. Ms. Erica Moody, as well as uh, Ms. Monica Petrella. Pret uh, mm -hmm. Sorry about that, with uh, UF IFAS Extension and uh, Ms. Dalia Bumbaka with The Well, a nonprofit organization. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, kind of give you a little background on, on uh, what initiatives we had had started with the CRAs as well as the uh, community, uh, the planning department, which relates to, uh, to identifying gaps in retail in the, in the most depressed areas in our, in our city. One of those, uh, <coughs> One of the reasons why we decided that this may be important to us is because every time we go to different community meetings, we hear time and time again that our local communities have very little access to retail items uh, in, the, in their neighborhoods. So, um, and I don't see the presentation yet. If we can go to the next slide. Next slide, please. So we, I'll just do it for you. Ah, you thank you. So one of the opportunities we identified was uh, to address the issue of lack to access to fresh and healthy foods. Um, and you heard from Ms. Petrella earlier this year, back in April. Uh, she talked to us about improved food systems in Tampa. Uh, but today you'll hear a little bit more about uh, internal and external partners and how we're looking to collaborate in the USDA's Healthy Food Financing Initiative grant proposal. And um, with that, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, ask uh, Director Moody to walk us through uh, the next couple of slides. So next slide, please. Good afternoon, Council. Sure. Erica Moody, CRA Director. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the low income, low access areas for food access. And this is really a citywide initiative, so this is why we're here at Council, but focusing in on the CRA communities and how we can really provide additional assistance and grants through the CRA to help inform some of these data driven decisions. 
So with that, I will uh, walk us through some definitions, move us into some data that we've collected, and then pass it off to the amazing people behind me uh, who are doing the heavy lifting of this grant application uh, that is due tomorrow. Uh, so we have a, so just some definitions. So low income is where the census tract poverty rate is 20% or greater, or where uh, 80, per, or, or where the median family income is 80% AMI or below. Uh, low access is where we're looking at 33% of the population being at least a half a mile or greater from being able to access uh, healthy, fresh produce. And then low income and low access are both of these uh, variables added together. So we have the low income and the low access track. And then getting into walkability, what is walkable, and the uh, definition of walkability is at least a quarter mile. So you'll see some info and some graphs as we move through that look at a half a mile versus a quarter mile as we think about walkability to these resources. Uh, so you'll see a graph here. Uh, everything in yellow is qualifies as low income and low access. Uh, so unfortunately, you see quite a bit of yellow here on the map, and that is where uh, our residents uh, do struggle to access uh, produce here. A little bit about the data collection process. Uh, we looked at, we started with East Tampa and Sulphur Springs, really zooming into these areas of need. Uh, and then we looked at the access inventory. So this is grocery stores, corner stores, uh, local markets, bodegas, uh, really where people in the neighborhood are going to get their, their food uh, and access that. And then we have a half mile, mile and a quarter mile as well. So here is the East Tampa CRA boundary, and you'll see uh, a dispersed map of different food access resource sites uh, from grocery stores, convenience stores, uh, butchers, uh, drug stores, and, and retail stores as well. And then of course we know where people are getting their food, it drives into their long-term health outcomes. So if there's more access to corner stores, there's more access to chips and soda and all of this, which contributes to our health outcomes, which then holistically contributes to how we move through our our life and our quality of life. Uh, so we do have a, a, a bit in East Tampa, um, but you'll see um, a lack of grocery store, especially in this next slide. You'll see a quarter mile and a half mile uh, radius within each one of these sites. Uh, and you'll see the east side of East Tampa and the southern uh, portion of the boundary and everywhere in yellow is really where we're, we're lacking access. So this helps us identify where the location would be best to put this retail assessment here. And we did the same thing in Sulphur Springs, but you'll see there's, there's less access in Sulphur Springs. And we have the same map here with a quarter mile and a half mile, and you'll see everything in blue uh, is, is not walkable or, or accessible for the community. So this really helped us identify the locations and where we would go first to start to look for this retail and fill in the gaps here. And with that, I will pass it off uh, so we can dive into the technicalities of the grant. We'll, we'll keep the uh, slides up. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Healthy Food Financing Initiative grant proposal. Oh yeah, sorry. My name is Dali Mumbaka. I work as the Director of Development, Development for the Wild Incorporated. We're a local 501c3 and we've been working in food, transportation, and, and small housing initiatives for the past, um, since 2014 as a formal nonprofit. Um, but I'm here today specifically representing our food work and the Healthy Food Financing Initiative grant proposal that we've um, been collaborating on with the city and specifically the Office of Economic Opportunity and the CRA, as well as Hillsborough County's Extension Office to create a collaborative model for how we can address some of these gaps in these communities. Um, so the grant itself is focused on developing a food financing program um, with these partners. And what that really means is a body that can help catalyze kind of food retail and food enterprises in, these na in underserved neighborhoods. Um, so as Erica mentioned, the deadline is tomorrow, and so we've had a large majority of this work uh, completed already, but let's see what the sixth one is. Um, so specifically, we're looking to apply for the capacity building activities, so really surveying the local communities and identifying these gaps through different tools that we have at our disposal. We really think this partnership is unique in that it will allow the, the city to really do a heavy lift of kind of what capacity looks like from a local government standpoint, as well as at the county level to see how can we translate that to other neighborhoods that are underserved. 
Um, but really the well and homegrown hills will work to be the program facing arm of this project. And so at the community level, working to with community members to understand what lived experience is like in um, being able to receive some of these assistances and that readiness. Um, so we'll also be providing technical assistance to food retailers and enterprises in an effort to um, make sure that they are at the point where they can then apply for future lending activities and that they're prepared for that. Um, we will not be applying for the credit enhancement portion of this grant at this time. This is a grant that comes uh, time and time again, and so we hope to apply for that in the future and work at this stage to identify some of those qualified lenders that are interested in uh, supporting the for future initiatives of this grant. And so it is a th uh, $1 million grant for the capacity building side. Over three years, we'll be able to execute these funds. And again, if we apply for the credit enhancement in the next year, or once this grant's completed, it will unlock $2 million of additional financing that we really will be able to be invested into these communities. And so I'm going to pass it off to Monica to describe our phased approach. Great. So my name is Monica Botrella. I work for Hillsborough County Extension, and I lead the program Homegrown Hillsborough. And so um, if it's hard to see the slide. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've broken this down into four phases. So the first phase is just the feasibility analysis of food retail and food enterprises. So basically understanding the current conditions and um, I guess appetite for um, future uh, food system development, um, especially the expensive stuff. Um, and so basically all infrastructure costs a lot of money and we're talking about a grocery store, um, but it can be other things too. There are things that we can do in the short and medium term that also cost money less dollars, um, but still some significant investments from different um, corner stores or um, community centers or churches that maybe want to introduce healthy food. So this is the healthy food financing um, initiative. And so healthy food can kind of be um, uh, considered a few ways. We want to find the ways that work for these communities. So um, this first year is going to be reaching out with uh, community organizations that are already invested in these in these neighborhoods, um, making sure they know about us and about the program, um, and hopefully identifying really great community assets where we can uh, work together and leverage these funds. Um, the second phase would be an actual uh, uh, pilot where we would hope to connect um, all the different components of the food system at this neighborhood level into one um, to be able to see what does it look like to flow dollars and produce and meals and all of that through a community. Um, and so, you know, everything takes, uh, you have a vision in your head, but to actually put it to work can always take a little more effort than you think. So this would allow us to actually um, do a pilot and see where we can strengthen um, our approach, um, what things we did well, so that way it could be uh, replicated throughout the city. Um, phase three is, I think, leadership recruitment. What does that say? Food, um, retailing, and food retailing and recruitment. Yeah. And so, um, so as much as um, we are invested in this neighborhood and these communities, ultimately these communities need to represent themselves. Um, and so I am not an East Tampa resident, so it doesn't make sense for me to be the leader within East Tampa. So through this process, we're going to identify leaders, train them on various food system concepts, um, and, and like I said, really kind of pass on that knowledge so it can become this community culture where there's natural leaders that can help um, you know, work at the future grocery store or help lead um, an initiative to, to transform what healthy food looks like in their own neighborhoods. Um, and so that's going to be, you know, those first few years we're working with these organizations, we're going to ask them to connect us to, to um, organic leadership that's already there, and we're going to help them speak the food system language and begin to kind of um, understand the concepts that it's taken us a long time to understand. Hopefully we can do that in a faster manner. Um, and then uh, phase four is identifying what to do next. So in anticipation of those uh, actual credit enhancement, there's a lot of money on the line um, and we wanna make sure that we are ready to receive that money. And so what can the city do? What incentives already exist? Tax increments. Um, there are other uh, national financing programs that we could leverage here. Who needs to be involved? Those kind of um, discoveries and explorations. So that way we can apply for the um, actual uh, credit enhancement big dollars, big infrastructure kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so to put it in perspective, Council, um, we, our intention, our first step is gonna to be to uh, develop some strategies that we can utilize in these two neighborhoods, specifically the Sulphur Springs area and the East Tampa CRA. Once we are able to deploy and tweak 
the, the programs in, the, in these two areas, then what we'd like to do is implement them throughout the city. Now, again, to put it in perspective, there are about 105 census blocks that are affected by low income, low access to fresh foods in Tampa, and that represents about 80 81,400 people. So uh, we think this is a very, very important program. It's important to be able to work with our partners. And uh, in our view, the, the fact that we're able to, uh, to develop the, the program throughout the next three years will give us the opportunity to, again, test, utilize these pilot areas as, as, uh, as the first steps, but then, again, deploy it throughout the city. And with that, we are ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, and thank you for Council Member uh, Vieira for bringing this up. Um, this is this is a huge issue, you know, food insecurity, access to to food, and one of the charts that you showed in the Sulphur Springs area, I noticed that there's like a Walmart neighborhood market there at Florida Avenue, south of Bush, and then at Waters. You have, I think it's a you save, or it used to be at one point, but beyond that, that area is is barren of, of fresh food sources, other than the occasional convenience store. Um, I know that this may not be a popular idea, and it's a CRA issue, but what, you know, I was thinking about proposing uh, the creation of a new CRA, which I know is more complicated than me just making a motion, but a CRA for Sulphur Springs uh, I was just there yesterday um, and just driving around and it's, I mean, it's just, it needs so much help. It's a beautiful neighborhood, but, uh, you know, why we don't have a CRA there, and there's a slum and blight that we need to access and, and, and fix and, and work on. Um, maybe that's something that I'll bring up in the future again. I know it's more complicated and I know it's not the most popular idea, but it's an area seen in this chart, you know, East Tampa, there were opportunities there to 22nd Street, Hillsborough Avenue, but then that southeast quadrant of the image that you showed, it's, it's invisible, you know, and that's a lot of residential in that area. So that's a greater, you know, a broader discussion that we can have. So um, who had their hand up first? I'm going to go Vieira, Carlson, and uh, Anderson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and, and I wanted to thank you all for your presentation. You know, when I see y'all speak, I, I, it's, um, you know, y'all are obviously very idealistic um, uh, public servants who are in the, um, uh, what I call the, the do-gooder business. And I say that in the most positive way. I would consider myself a do-gooder as well. And there's nothing more honorable than people who go into the public sector to give back to marginalized communities and give people a voice. And, and that's what this is all about. And, um, you know, this is something that I think should be very, very exciting for all of us. I, I think that having a goal of by the time we leave in 2027 of having a grocery store in East Tampa is something that we should all get behind. It's something that's very, very exciting. You know, I latched on to this because um, I, I'd heard, I guess it was in the old council, some folks were speaking on it. And, and it's just Don, I, I counted the number of grocery stores where I live. And I think within 15 minutes, there's like 12 or 13, maybe more. And if I didn't have a single one, I'd be really, really angry. And I would wonder where my local government is and making that happen. And when I mean making that happen, again, my vision for this is, is using robust city CRA dollars to, to make this happen, but to create a bridge, right? where the private sector can invest in, in this area for a sustainable long-term grocery store that is going to be successful. And we can do that by leveraging uh, uh, not just public dollars, but public excitement and public optimism by making this a really, really big goal. You know, and, and this really comes down to a philosophy of what government is here for. I always believe government is here for to do for people what they can't do for themselves, but in areas of what I call respect and dignity. You know, getting good health care when you're sick, respect and dignity. Having good quality housing, respect and dignity. Having a public school so that you can have upward mobility in your life, that's respect and dignity. Job training, all these different kinds of things. And having a grocery store in your neighborhood, that's something, I mean, if, if, if you got a community like we do in Tampa and, and across many communities in the United States that, that have been left behind and marginalized where there's not even a grocery store, that is a call for a, an understanding of neglect 
right? And that's what we have here where the private market has not been able to provide in this community what the private market should. So government needs to make a way, needs to make a way. And that's what this is all about. So again, I'm, I'm committed to investing, again, within reason, right? Um, wh whatever we need, whether it's from the CRA, whether it's from the city of Tampa, um, to make sure that we can get our grocery store here in, in, uh, in, in East Tampa. I think that's, that's something that we can all get behind. So my question to y'all, after all my pontificating is, what do you need from us? Because we have it coming back in the CRA. What do y'all need from us at this point to help empower you to do what you can? Because we're also talking about Sulphur Springs, Councilman Maniscalco or Chairman Maniscalco brought up Sulphur Springs, which is of course not in the CRA. <clears throat> so what do y'all need from us acting as city council to help move this forward, if you can answer that. Thank you, Councilman Vieira. So the, the answer to your question is uh, the, uh, plan, uh, the planning department is actually working on a community, uh, community uh, analysis for, for Sulphur Springs. Uh, and for now, we are kind of in the, in the uh, planning phase. Mm -hmm. So uh, we plan to come back to you, I think, between now and probably March, January we would March. have very solid idea of how we w want to implement all these tactics. Thank so you. we should. So we should have you come back in March, more or less. Okay. More or less. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so again, the vision is, is to make sure that we create a pathway so that the private sector can sustain and support a grocery store in East Tampa. Uh, the, the, the people are there. The stomachs are there, the dollars are there, the, the city dollars are there to make it happen so that it can be independent. Um, you know, and, and, and there's folks who may say, well, why, why are y'all getting involved in a grocery store? Um, and, and when I mean, a, I say a grocery store, I want to be I'm not talking about the city of Tampa running a grocery store. I'm talking about the city of Tampa doing what it can to create a pathway so that the private sector can help produce a grocery store through third party uh, 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 partners. But again, if that was your community and you didn't have a grocery store, you would ask, where's my city? Where's my local government? The folks that I pay taxes to, why aren't they helping to create uh, spur private sector innovation and enterprise and vigor in that area so that we can have this sign of, again, dignity and respect. So that's that's what this issue is all about for me. So um, I guess, uh, should I make the motion? Wait, Councilman oh, or at the end. Councilman yeah. Henderson. That's fine. Yeah, um, <coughs> I'll take a tangent for a second because the uh, chair mentioned it, but I've said before I'm a, a thousand percent against <coughs> any new CRAs anywhere. All my time's up already. <laughs> 30 I, seconds. I'm, I, I, I'm against a new CRA anywhere. I think that CRAs are for lazy policy makers. Um, if we create a CRA around Sulphur Springs, there's going to be zero new money that we don't that we won't already have. The only the reason why people create CRAs is because they want massive development, and the way you get massive development is you subsidize it. And that model is all it's all about gentrification and all about big development. As I've said before, if we want, if Sulphur Springs wants 20-story condos along the river, fine then we'll create a CRA because that's what they're for. But if, but we could, we could create, we'll have a discussion today, we could create a model, we could, we could say within this geographic boundary, whatever the tax increase is for the next three years, we'll commit as city council, hopefully the mayor's support, that we'll spend that money just on Sulphur Springs. Or we don't even have to do that. We can say, what does Sulphur Springs need? And we can dedicate money there. A CRA won't, by itself, won't create any new money. We can, what we need to do is be disciplined to uh, put the money there. We're going to be lucky with the attitude of the, of the legislature and a lot of a lot of citizens. We'll be lucky to hang on to the CRAs we have right now over the next few years because the legislature wants to get rid of them. Um, let's just let's please look at other options. This problem with the CRA is it's long term and it's all about real estate development. We can figure out other solutions for for Sulphur Springs and other areas that need them. Um, uh, we could say if we move half the money out of downtown, we could say we want over the next three years for 20% of it to go to Sulphur Springs. I would fully support that. And that would be like $5 million a year. That's more than the CRA would generate in 10 years probably. Um, I, I mentioned before, years ago I was involved, uh, I was working with Cash and Carry when they went into um, Tangerine Plaza in St. Pete. And I don't remember what the subsidy was, but when the subsidy ran out, they left. And then Walmart came in and that, when the subsidy ran out, they left. Um, the subsidies of big uh, retailers don't work 
Um, they're massive amounts of money, and they, they don't work. Um, and and uh, you know there there was a there are other models of, of of subsidizing big big retailers. But what I would really suggest, and I think Councilmember Vr was kind of alluding to this, is that is that we focus on the small one. You guys call them bodegas. It, it, I think the the map when it says convenience stores, it gives a, a misrepresentation of what it is. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I took a tour of the food marts in East Tampa, and what what people in South Tampa call a, a, a convenience store is different what, than what I saw yesterday. And instead of spending, you know, we have one big developer with lots of money who's asking us for $5 million for a, for a, a grocery store and they just want us to write a check. I asked one of the intermediaries, what if we bought the office condo for that and, and then lease it as subsidy because then at least we would have equity. And they said, no, we just want a handout. Okay, I don't agree with that model. Instead, we could go to some of these small, um, food marts that are family owned and one of the guys yesterday said I'm trying to get an, another cooler so I can put um, deli meat I need another cooler so I can put fresh produce okay well that would cost us what five or ten thousand dollars if we if we supported that one of them has a big piece of land around them and uh, uh, there's you could you could conceivably build an affordable housing complex all around it and, the, and it could monetize the family's property and, and then you could help use that money plus some small subsidies to, um, to, to renovate the building and build it out. I think the strategy has to be, to, because we have to hit a lot of neighborhoods and even with the CRA, we don't have enough. It's, it's no good if, uh, uh, if we put one Publix in the middle of East Tampa, that's not good enough. We need, we need access to people so that ideally they can walk to their food mart. Some of them we need code enforcement and and police like we did with a case a couple weeks ago that I shouldn't talk about. But, um, but we, we need to focus on these family owned businesses with small amounts of money, we can help them grow. But we need to build them around neighborhood commercial districts. And there are lots of places in our, in our CRA districts where we can build neighborhood commercial districts. We build density, we build coffee shops with co-work space, we build affordable housing. Um, we build transit hubs. There are lots of things that we can do. So I think we can accomplish the goal of bringing the food people need uh, with that. The, um, the last thing I'd say is, um, I didn't hear anybody mention uh, uh, community gardens. And let's be sure to remember um, the community gardens and other sources of uh, fresh food as well. Thank you. Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair. Um, since this is about the grant, <laughs> I wish you well with the deadline coming up as tomorrow. Um, you know, we have this challenge and this is just one way to address it. Of course, CRAs began um, because of systemic disinvestment. So that's why I'll just say that. And I agree with you that Sulphur Springs um, needs some love some kind of way. And I don't know how, but we definitely need to start talking about that in a bigger way. But as for you all, what you've done collectively and individually, I know is taken up an enormous amount of time to put the data together. And I just um, send you, <laughs> I wish you cross, well, cross your and you come back and we have a great celebration because we're gonna be awarded this grant because of your hard work. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I agree, uh, you know, I have good feelings. We have a good, good uh, luck with grants in this city. We have a, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that we get the grant, but if not, we do have funds that mm -hmm. we can work on. Uh, I'm excited about the idea of grocery just in a whole different, in, in, a, in a wide variety of ways. Uh, and I agree with Councilman Carlson in that the most successful groceries are probably gonna be small and targeted. <clears throat> and uh, growing up in Gainesville, we have a great community grocery store called Wards. And Wards sells literally every piece of an animal and every, and every kind of vegan anything you want. Mm -hmm. it, it is truly a melting pot of the entire community. They also buy extra produce from farms mm -hmm. around the area. It, but they don't sell it if people don't buy it. So we're not talking about a Publix. We're not talking about a Winn-Dixie. We're talking about a really targeted space. And I think that's the kind of idea that we're looking for, a very targeted. Mm -hmm. It's also where the best plants are sold. Yes, so 
yeah, all of my, all of the, I, I was just up with my mom this weekend and I brought home too many plants, but um, that's what my husband would say to them. Uh, also though, in addition to that, looking at Tangerine Plaza and lessons learned, and I think that's one of the lessons learned is that we have to talk about smaller targeted stores based on what people in the community want, which is why I think this grant is so fabulous because you're talking to the communities about what they want in their areas. So as we're helping um, either build up these corner stores or create corner stores in areas where there aren't, how we, what we choose or how we help people put that type of food in there and how we connect people. Uh, another thing I would love to look at if we ended up with, a, with land is and we were able to you know, build a corner store for someone to also have a community center next to it that could focus on cooking classes and nutrition and all those things that people really need. And it wouldn't, obviously, we can't do that for every single neighborhood, so maybe maybe a mobile something where, where folks can come in with cooking classes or just, just something that we are also encouraging people who have had nothing really but a corner store to to kind of branch out and you know okay i can buy mustard greens but what do i do with them mm -hmm. that sort of thing and which link lends me to the last thing i was visiting my mom this weekend and i took a bike ride and i went past this garden called the um, gainesville giving garden mm -hmm. and they were having volunteer hours so i stopped dropped my bike and i spent two hours in the garden and pulling weeds and harvesting and what they do is it's a, solely a production garden they grow and then just give away. And they don't do the giving away themselves. They work with other nonprofits and those nonprofits deliver to people's houses, deliver to community centers, wherever it is. Uh, we were harvesting that day for Shan's um, child pediatrics. So, I mean, just, they have a different group every time. And again, they don't do it, but uh, through community grants, they bought stuff like they had a, finally had a second refrigerator, and that was a really big deal. And uh, we had a really good conversation. So yes, community gardens, but in a different way, because you can't just plop a community garden anywhere. It doesn't work that way. Uh, but with this production garden, they had, folk, they had students from UF who had never had no idea what anything looked like and we they really had to go down with us to tell us okay this is a weed and this is what it mm -hmm. looks like and this is what you're pulling which was really fascinating and actually very supportive for me because I thought wow okay then people really need no experience to actually be active and helpful in a in a garden setting and we as some members of city council went to feeding Tampa Bay yesterday and that was another experience where no experience necessary they teach you everything you need to know right there just gave me a huge positive for how we can move forward to reach to have food access kind of everywhere I, I cannot wait to see what you all come back with I can't wait to see what the what citizens have to say if there's anything help you need uh, we're, we're all on board Councilmember Vieira, would you like to make a motion? Sure, if I may, to have this come back in the first week in March. And, and, and like Councilman Hertek said, there's a lot of exciting things happen. I know we're meeting yes. with one nonprofit on this to try to move this forward. So um, we'll see something forward by then, I'm sure. So the first week of March, if yes, ma'am, if, if, if that's good with y'all. And as always, if y'all need more time, just let us know. We have a motion from Councilmember Vieira. Do we have a second? Second, second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank awesome. you. And one last thing, Council. If uh, we would love for your support uh, for this grant, so if you can. Uh, you need to write a letter tonight. <laughs> We got the letters. Okay. So it seems like you're supportive. I think we'd be asking for a motion on, on the floor to support the submission yes. of this grant. Sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Make that motion. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion to support the grant uh, in any way in any way possible. So this is a capacity building grant. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Second. Second awesome. that motion. Thank you. I second, second that second. motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's an enthusiastic yes that you can, yes. Thank you you so can much. throw Thank that you. in there. We appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, council members, we have a few more items on the agenda. I have an event at 6.30. I have one at 7. Okay. I think we can do it. We can do okay. it. Okay. Um, item number 77 is the chief of staff to talk about imposing a public safety impact fee. Are you ready to present, sir? I'm sorry? Are you ready to present public for 77? 
Oh, we have Mr. Massey. Okay. We prepared a memo. Yeah, I mean, it was asking for um, the process for doing so and where we were in connection with that process. I've already provided several memos okay. outlining the process, I, so I just attached those. We have um, already cons uh, contacted Raftilis, who is our consultant for these types of matters. Uh, they have prepared a draft work order for us. We, I think we have a call with them next week to talk about the work order. Okay. There's a few questions, that, and that's really the first step. We've got to engage the consultant for them to start the impact fee study. So that's Is there a date at. that you can come back and just give us an update? Not another report, because you've given multiple memos, but just after you have this call? Or another memo. Um, if you want another update in 60 days, we can give you an update. Okay, in just 60 so days. we know what to do sure. and, and how we can, ex you know, move forward with this. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, the, the, I mean, they're going to have to interview both the police and fire department. Look at the studies that they've done. That okay. information, it, it, the, the the impact fees have to be. And one of the questions, one of the questions I have for the consultant is whether we should have separate fees for police and fire or just one public service impact fee. But they're going to have to look look at and come look at our localized data in order to come up with the fee. And so that they've got to do a fee study first. So, but we can come back, I think, in 60 days and tell 60 you. 60 days would be January 11th then. Sure. The 25th of January? 25th okay. of January is fine. Um, Council Member Carlson. Uh, in the document, I didn't see how much the consultant was going to charge. Was that in there? Did I miss it or did no, you No, it wasn't. Mr. O'Hara may have that amount. Mike, Mike, it's about eighty thousand dollars or thereabouts. So it's less than the hundred thousand dollar threshold um, that we come to council. But that's should we make a motion to have you bring that back, uh, that co contract back, or would you? The just con bring you it back we, on? I don't think we. You have to it, because it's below the hundred thousand dollar threshold, and we already have a contract with them. All we need to do okay. is issue administratively. But a you work don't think order. you need. You don't think you need us to do. Okay. Else? No? That's it. All right, so we will see you January 25th. Do you need a formal motion? Yes. All right, so a motion from Councilmember uh, Carlson, second from Councilmember Henderson, and this motion is for Mr. Massey or the Finance Department to just give us an update on the, uh, the discussions with the consultant. This will be under staff reports January 25th. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. All right, next is item number 78. This is a motion by Council Member Vieira. Oh, this is about a draft ordinance that will preclude city council from raising their own salaries beyond the inflation adjust adjustment. And yes, sir. If I may very, very briefly, um, so, so just explain this. You know, uh, my, my concern with this was when we were talking about a prospective salary increase, my major objection to it was that it was going to take effect before an election. Um, and, and we have the 27th Amendment to the Constitution that says that Congress may not raise their own salary, uh, get the benefit of it, I should say, until after an election. And that's the simple idea behind this. Um, this wouldn't preclude any inflation adjustments. Um, and if it was beyond inflation adjustment, then council couldn't see the benefit of it until after an election. Um, and, and that's it. And, and, and what I would do just to save on time is we can take a brief poll of council and saying who I, I had originally wanted this to be in the charter and was told we could do it by ordinance. So to be efficient, I, I moved it for an ordinance. But again, uh, if uh, if uh, council supportive of it, whatever, we can take a quick poll, whatever, to uh, save our, our lawyer friend here, Mr. Uh, and Justin. What, and what is well, the question that you're, you're and if he wants to go, I mean, I'm just trying to save people time. That's all. Okay, Mr. Vasky, go ahead, sir. Justin Vasky, Legal Department. Just <coughs> briefly, this is a draft ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, you would have to bring it back in a month yeah. or so to, to uh, start the, the approval process. But uh, some key provisions of this ordinance are that the inflation or cost of living adjustment that uh, previously approved by City Council and the mayor in a 1998 resolution will be codified. And just a reminder, that 1998 resolution provided that salaries of City <coughs> Council members would be automatically increased by the same across the board percentage that all other managerial and city employees receive annually, if any, so long as the increase does not exceed 3% annually for city council members. Um, then the other part of it, the most important part, would be any increase in the salaries of city council members other than those increases I just discussed must be set forth in a separate resolution approved by the majority of the entire city council with the written concurrence of the mayor and will be only effective upon the commencement of the next term of office 
of city council members. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Henderson, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I, I'm glad we're finally getting to talk about this because I, I remember um, the mayor proposing a salary increase um, for, for city council after a study um, that indicated that, you know, council members, or the recommendation came back for a salary increase that was voted down. And so now it sounds like we're trying to only um, address it from a standpoint of an increment when there was an indication that council was underpaid. Can you address that part of it? I or really no? can't address those that, Was issues. that it? Or do y'all know? Y'all were here. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell me. Who would like yeah. to explain? I mean, I'll explain it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was basically... It, it was something that was put in front of us right before a uh, an election, and they thought that that might it, that might hurt people. And because I voted for it, every single flyer was like, "She wants to raise her salary," blah blah blah. So it was. It was very effective in that way. Obviously, not so effective because I won by twenty percent, but still, um, it uh, <clears throat> the idea that that we shouldn't raise our salaries because the public doesn't approve of that it was just unfounded. No one talked to us about that on the election. Right. No one. Right. No one cared. It didn't come up. Right. That, and, and the issue is that this should be a livable wage. Um, I've talked about it all the time that I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a giant project for, for my other job, and I, I, don't, I, can't have, I cannot find time to do it. I was supposed to work on it this weekend, then the shooting, and I'm constantly on the phone with people. I had, to, <coughs> I had to stop doing my other work because this just takes so much time, and I think it's worth it. I'm one of seven people who gets the benefit of this job. I am so lucky. In the four years I'm here, well, I guess five with the other one, I'm, I'm just I'm dedicating. I feel like this is my time. You know, I may not, I may not decide to go four more years. And while I'm here, I need to make a salary that enables me to focus solely on what I'm doing. And I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not the issue of, and that was the issue that we were all talking about. But the real issue was, um, was the election. Yeah. But this seems like it would close the door. Oh, yeah. No, I, I don't support this at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> this would close the door for that opportunity because yeah. the, so... Uh, the mayor presented it, and you know I can see why you're saying that, you know, because it was an election. But if she presented it again, you know, it, would that be an issue with this council? And may I may I make a statement, Mr. Chair, really fast? May I? So so I'm glad Councilman Hertak brought up the election issue, which is I brought this up well before with nothing to do with the dang election. And and by the way, your point's very well taken. That that's why every time this came up, I'm like. Oh boy, because because unfortunately that issue was used as a as a hammer, right? In election, so it kind of poisons the well in this issue. So your point is very well taken in that regard. And so I, I, I however, I will say this does not preclude us from raising our salaries beyond inflation, only getting the benefit of it after an election. That's it. We can raise our sal, we can triple our salaries, but we first have to face the voters. But again, so I, I want to say your point is very well taken because that salary issue was obviously used as a hammer during the election, and so my, you know, you know okay. sentiments. The, it's just like Tallahassee. Um, when you have a salary wage that's low like this, and at the state level, what it does is it suppresses minority populations and women from actually seeking office because of the wages. And so that's why rich people are making decisions for us because they can afford, especially at the state level, you know, because they can afford to, because the, what 20, they make 20, they don't even make $30,000 a year, $29,000. And so, you know, that's kind of like my issue with this. Um, the, and for the record, this is less than what, you know, an average teacher makes. Yeah. <laughs> so that is what's really deplorable about it. And I did appreciate when I read in the paper that the mayor increased the salaries or attempted to. And so, um, you know, the fact that it was rejected, I'm glad we're having this conversation so I can understand it. 
I hear the um, po um, political implications behind it, but I just don't want to lock us into a situation where, you know, it's a 3% increase, but yet you're not looking at how hard we're working and the things that we do, because what people don't know is behind the scenes, the enormous amount of research and reading and asking questions is, uh, and, and of course, the community events that you're invited to, you know, which is wonderful. I'm having an amazing time. I'm, I'm used to working um, long hours. And um, but this is I, I just don't I would hate for this body to lock themselves into this. Um, the the um, inflation and cost of living increase when you're not even at a wage that is considered professional. And just a reminder, currently, without this ordinance, mm -hmm. you can increase your base salary beyond the 3%. It has to be done by resolution mm -hmm. with concurrence of the mayor. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Carl. Yeah. yeah, just to just to add in for a second um, to what um, Councilmember Ertek said, what happened a year ago during budget was that Chief of Staff said among the, you know, there's a thousand pages of the budget, and, and he highlighted like 10 things. And one of them was, and by the way, we're going to mm -hmm. give City Council, I forgot what it was, 49% increase in, in salaries, 40% increase in salaries. And um, it, out of all the things that could have been highlighted, that was one of them. And um, I believe philosophically that City Council has paid way too low. Um, I, I think that if you look at the best governments in the world, they pay a fair wages because they don't want people to have to ask for freebies and, and, and ask for money. Um, you know, mm -hmm. we've, if you read the media about some of our predecessors, you'll see <laughs> things that happen. And, um, and, and we need to have good government here and, and making a little bit more than what we make right now, which for the public is what, 56,000 or something? It's, is it 50, it's, 53. it's oh. not, um, it, it, uh, it's, it, it, you want to have hardworking, smart people. You want people to be able to give up their full-time job to do this. And so anyway, what happened is Chief of Staff mentioned it. Suddenly, Twitter goes off, the media comes out, city council is considering a 40% vote, and it, and it didn't say at first that the mayor had proposed it. So I, I and maybe others pushed back and said, well, the mayor <laughs> proposed it. Stephanie Pointer said she had actually proposed it. The mayor's office said, well, John Dingfelder had asked for it. And we said, well, Dingfelder's been gone for a year. Why are we proposing something that John, none of us proposed? That Dingfelder, if he did, proposed it back then based on what Stephanie Pointer had asked. And, and the vote was four to three. She and I were two of the two of the ones that voted for it. I philosophically be, believe in good government. I think that city council should get be paid, paid a fair way. I thought that I even proposed, and we discussed it, that city council should get paid more than what the mayor had proposed. And then the the reporter at the time tweeted it and wrote about how crazy I was. I want to give salary raises, um, and all of that was uh, what I what I. I don't care. I didn't care that they were setting us up for a political fight because I thought philosophically I'm going to do what I think is right. It turns out that a couple of months before they had done a poll, and part of it was a push poll, but that's the same poll they used to convince the guy to run against me, and and a bunch. They it, I can show you the slides or bring them in if you want. But we have copies of the push poll that they ran, and and they they message tested on us to ask um, what messages would test best, and the message that tested best was the one about um, raising our own salaries. And so they ran, for me, they ran three or four mailers on you know, ugly picture, me raising my own salary. It had zero impact. I didn't have a single complaint from anybody about it. A few people grumbled online, but they were probably fake accounts. And, uh, and, and I won by 20% also. It had zero impact. So their polls were all wrong all the way around. Uh, thank goodness they have bad polling. Uh, but they got bad press about us. They had some social media, and it still had no impact. I, so it's not it's not a political issue. Um, they tried to make it a political issue, but to me, we have to figure out how to how to build good government. I would propose that we that we raise the salary for the next uh, city council. I when I discussed this this salary before, I said I I won't accept it, but I want other people to have it because I want people to have a living wage. I don't want. City yeah. council members asking for free tickets to go to events because they can't afford to go, or pay twenty five dollars for parking when you've invited been invited to an awards program at yeah, a hotel. Yeah, <laughs> I mean ethics are ethics are really important. So I yeah. think um, for ca council member uh, Vieira's request, I appreciate him keeping it on the agenda. I seconded it. Council member Vieira has been very helpful for me sometimes at seconding things just for discussion that he doesn't agree with, and I did the same in this case. I, I don't agree with this, but I, I, I supported him in carrying the issue forward and discussing it. 
Um, I think that we ought to pass a charter. I tried, to, I tried to do this a year ago when I was politicized, but I think we ought to pass a charter amendment that sets up a, 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 a salary committee, just like we have a charter committee, maybe once every 10 years, and it would have to be after an election that the, the, the salary committee would meet and determine the mayor's salary and then and it wouldn't go down, but it, we could see if it goes up or stays the same. And then um, ideally that committee's recommendation would just go into effect instead of, but if we needed two people could vote on it. But then, then city council would be a percentage of it. If city council just made 50% and the reporter made fun of me a year ago, again, it had no impact. If city council made 50% of the mayor's salary, it would be like 90,000. That is, you can't hire a mid-level person with 10 hours, 10 years of experience for 90,000 right now. Um, our aides all mostly make, make yeah. more than that. And so um, it, 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 I'm okay if we do it for the next city council, but I, I think the city council should have flexibility to provide for good government to approve this. Thank you. Thank you very if much. I may. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, if we're throwing around ideas and we want to talk about increasing it to close to that, maybe just smaller increment instead of a 40% raise. Years. Yeah, over the next few to years, 10% yeah. to get to yeah. there. I think that's a more palatable. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be honest, I don't think waiting till the next council is right. the way to go. Like, I just, I don't. And uh, it was very <laughs> clear because this was an election issue that it wasn't an issue. It just right. wasn't. And if folks had had trouble with it, they would have let us know. We have been very good stewards of the, t the taxpayers' money. We did not uh, approve a mill. We've worked really hard. We, even today, we had multiple things where we're trying to help the dollar. citizens bring in the money. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be open to more suggestions. You know, a larger salary increase maybe for a future council, but I really do agree with Councilman Carlson that we should get to that 50% mark for the work we do to make this a, a, a job that, that folks can do without having to have a second job. And in fact, incentivizing people because as a teacher, I don't know how you do it because I never would have been able to run for council if I was still in the classroom. I, I just couldn't do it. I, you, you are a superhuman. You're a you do not sleep very much. I don't. Because, I mean, having been there, that is an 80 hour a week job. Yeah, I'm crazy. Well, and you, and, and the love, and I mean, oh, that, the, and the emotion that goes into each of those children, and then here, the emotion that goes into each issue, and the, the research and the study <coughs> is, is so much uh, that I, I've, I work, I, I yeah, I work about as much as I did when I was a teacher, just on this. So I, I, I do what, think, yeah. What about the committee that already exists, our budget, um, our, our, our committee that we selected, their, what is their, their called? Budget Advisory Committee. Right. They, they supported it. They, right, they did. And so we don't have to create a new committee. We could have them present it and let them study it rather than, and you know, we can do that right now because they currently exist. And... Um, you know, let them bring it back to council what they're recommending. Um, I like increments. I can, I can see people being mind blown about the 40%. But what I can say on the campaign trail is that it did not come up once as a question from a citizen. Not one time did it come up. Um, and I want not only just us, but even future, you know, generations of folks um, who are excited that there are two women on council, that it's diverse. Um, not to, 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 to be unencumbered and not afraid to run for office. Mm -hmm. Remember the young man that um, took Valerie Jarrett's seat? You know, he used all of his funds running and ruined his credit, and then he gets to D.C., and he can't even awesome. get a place to live because he's ruined his credit running for office, and now he finally is actually at a decent salary, but he ruined his credit in the process. And, that's, and I teach personal finance, so that's just that just really broke my heart. I just feel like we should set the benchmark now because I have the courage to do something like this. I don't care you know, who's attacking me because I've worked three jobs before <laughs> and went to grad school and worked the three jobs. So I understand that it is important that we address this and be, you know, because we're good public servants, to put it in the hands of our committee um, to bring it back to us very soon. That's what I would like to propose. 
but I know, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, and if I may to yeah, go close. Ahead. So, so it, it's, it's funny because again, what one of the, it, it's, you remember the, the meme of Homer Simpson going in the bushes, that's me right now, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, but, but again, the unfortunate thing of this and that this is why I, I, I uh, you know, whenever there's on the agenda, when I use the word trigger, I don't mean that in a, in a comical sense. I mean, the, it, it is a trigger for folks who had it used against. I totally respect that. So obviously withdrawing that again, I still stand on the principle that if we do a salary increase beyond our inflation adjustments for cost of living, that ought to take the benefit for the next council, which I'm very, very open to, uh, to that obviously. I think there's a more than reasonable uh, discussion to be had for that. So again, Homer Simpson in the bushes right now, so there you go. Did and, you and mean again, that when you say next council, like this one, because you said it the last time? Are we the next council? No. no. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you, we won. You won the election in March. So well this said. is it. We are. I, in, we're in it right I, now. I have been served and have. I have been served and have 20 days to file Boom. a responsive pleading. Yeah, yeah. that is it. Yes, so we next are council. next. You shouldn't. You shouldn't come when Alan's not here. I know. <laughs> So, so there you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, one Thank of the, you. One of Thank the comments you. that I saw on social media when the millage increase was being proposed, one of the Facebook comments was, city council should start by cutting their salaries in half instead of looking at this millage increase. And I'm like, cutting the salaries in half now, you know? But comments will be comments online. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Next up is um, a rule to remove the comprehensive plan amendment. There's a memo from Mr. Shelby, but I see Mr. Benson in the audience. Is this your item, uh, Sir 79? Are you going to be talking on that? Okay. I'll talk about it. All right. That's me. Uh, Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Good evening, Council. Um, I prepared for you a proposed uh, amendment uh, to uh, a rule, four point, uh, rule 4 uh, F. And basically what it says uh, is adding the words request by the public for reconsideration of legislative matters, amendments to the city of Tampa's comprehensive plan, including text and map amendments, are not subject to reconsideration. And I had an assumption in there that council wanted the um, ban on reconsideration uh, to include both text and map amendments if council fish wishes to, to, to have one or the other rather than both. Certainly you can do so, but this is all encompassing and I trapped it that way for your consideration. If you wish we to have the, the motion was initially uh, yeah. originated by Councilman Carlson, but go, can, go ahead, ma'am. Can you please just uh, refresh our memory and the public's yes. memories why yes. this is coming up? Yes, uh, Council, and Mr. Benson can speak very well to this. Oh, okay. There are, there is a procedures manual for the, um, uh, resubmission of a plan that had been denied rather than reconsideration and it's very much the same rule that you have in your code now that applies to quasi-judicial matters. There came a time that when a council, for instance, before city council directed it be changed, when a, uh, when a, uh, uh, a development order was denied, the neighborhood would leave, the uh, applicant would leave, but the applicant would return the next regular meeting and ask for reconsideration without the public being present. Um, and in order to make that consistent, um, we changed the rules in the code and in the rules of procedure to have them not subject to consideration. Those are the, um, the land use that's quasi-judicial and also to, um, uh, to still allow procedures that give somebody the opportunity to submit it within the, what is it, one year ban on resubmitting. Would you like to speak to it? Steve, you can speak to it more eloquently than I, Mr. Benson. I'll do my best. Stephen Benson, City Planning Director. The, uh, the waiting period is, is a year. It's 12 months. And it's not to reconsider an existing application that was denied. It's, it's to resubmit the same application again. Um, you can come back before the 12-month period if you change the category you're asking for, you change the size, and if you add a parcel, for instance. Um, but otherwise, the 12-year would apply. There isn't a provision to to bring back an application that was denied in your plan amendment <coughs> procedures manual. So this is bringing, I believe, the rules of procedure sort of into consistency with the plan amendment procedures manual. Yes, sir. Can I just add, it also keeps it from being arbitrary. Um, yeah, yeah. Do 
we need a motion, Mr. Shelby? Yes, yeah. If you could just, uh, if, if it's council's pleasure to do that, just to direct me to do that, uh, to bring this back for uh, council as a uh, an amendment to your rules of procedure. Uh, just to follow up, council, if I could take 30 seconds just to inform you that uh, last Thursday I had a two-hour meeting with um, Ms. Lucas and uh, Ms. Edwards to talk about the process to be able to streamline your agenda, your regular agenda. Uh, it was a great brainstorming meeting. Um, there's been excellent suggestions. What I'd like council to consider, and I know you don't have a full council present, but a short special discussion meeting at some point. What? Ultimately, we could, we could bring that up under new business, but I just want you to know that if that's something that council would consider, um, rather than bring back multiple things, I'd include this into that provision. Otherwise, I'll just come back with a single provision to get this um, uh, in effect. Right. As of right now, um, well, somebody will bring this up during new business. Okay, is that all right? That? No, that during new business. But I'll move this. Oh, okay. We have a motion from Councilwoman Hertak, second from Councilmember Carlson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. I'll bring that back. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. Yes. We are at the last item of the day. And that is item number seven. And we have the city attorney and Mr. Massey in the audience. Yes. And Ms. Sharp, I'm going to need her after that. Someone's dancing in the moonlight. <laughs> Dan I would have never thought That's dancing in the moonlight. That's one of the lamest songs ever. Everybody learns something new about everybody. I was going to run out for ice cream. <laughs> That's what it sounded like to me. I thought he was strictly a John Williams Star Wars song person, but now we know. Do you have your alarm set for tomorrow to listen to the new Beatles song? No, I already listened to the new Beatles song. I'll bring that up during new business. Okay. Session. So, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Shelby, did you want to lead or did you want me to? This is, this was a joint effort, so I don't want to steal the thunder. Council, you've had the opportunity to see uh, the, uh, the ordinance that has been presented to you. We haven't addressed the issue that you and I talked about with is that change. Um, and I think that, is, uh, that deserves some discussion. But Council, um, this provides for a process that through a very long discussion that Council has had and uh, a lot of work on Ms. Zellman's part working with me looking at what's out there. We've provided what we think in lieu of an insurance policy. However, even within the ordinance, it still allows for the possibility of an insurance policy down the road if council so chooses. But what you have here is you have a process by which that in addition to what already exists under state statute and case law to allow for reimbursement after the fact, this allows for the ability for council to have the, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The comfort of knowing that there is a process in place for you to have your legal expenses covered by the city as you go through the process so long as you meet certain criteria and that's all set forth in the ordinance and rather than take the time, Ms. Zellman, is there anything you wish to add to that? And just another reminder, Council, you don't have a full Council present today, but certainly it's on for first reading and it would be coming back if Council wishes to move forward. With the exception of one issue that was a, a change that was made at the last minute um, that I think has a significant impact on, um, uh, on uh, uh, the coverage, the, peri the period of coverage relating to what's possibly happening as a result of what happens during your term in office. And then we'll start with Councilman Carlson after. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, again, Marty has, has explained this. Um, I don't know how much detail you want us to go into, um, given the hour. Um, I think I'd rather answer questions. You want me to unless you, want us, you, you feel like as if you want us to explain this. Yeah, just, just for public or whoever, um, uh, the, the, typically on any kind of board, there's insurance to cover board members. It's the only way that board members can feel secure in, 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 in working in a position. <coughs> what we discovered through the last few years is that the city council does have insurance, but it's over 500,000. And uh, if, 
if, if one of us <coughs> spends um, $20,000 out of $56,000 salary, that's a lot of money. And um, the, um, the, there, in the last few years, there have been lawsuits filed, there's been subpoenas filed, there's been extensive public records filed. And if you have anything that you have to have your own attorney look at, or you have to get advice from your attorney, you have to pay for it yourself. And uh, because, because bef until now, the, anything below 500,000 is at the sole discretion of the city attorney. Um, so out of the 25,000 or so that I've spent, there's 5,000 I'm still <laughs> having friendly discussions with Andrea about getting back that I spent more than a year ago. And they have reimbursed some of it, but the, the idea is that um, city council will feel protected. And the, and the reason is that, first of all, you don't want people filing frivolous lawsuits against you. We've seen in other cities and counties, people file frivolous lawsuits just to intimidate um, uh, board, uh, board members or, or elected officials, um, or they try to bankrupt people. And so this way we show that we have um, uh, protection. And as, as Councilman Miranda says, if somebody's actually done something wrong, then then that will get adjudicated and, and, and we'll end up with. But this is mainly to protect us against um, people who don't like the process of democratic government and, and, and legislative decisions. Thank you very much, so, Councilman Carlson. If I could respond just real yeah. quickly. Now, we all have to go back to remember there's, there's a fundamental premise in Florida law that you can't spend taxpayer funds on private mm -hmm. interests. Um, providing a legal defense for elected officials is, isn't when they're sued individually is really an exception to that rule and it's provided um, in you know, specific circumstances outlined in both common law and the statute. But this ordinance doesn't change the fact that all the case law the statute and now this ordinance goes to a situation in which any one of you is sued or a claim is made basically threatening a lawsuit in your individual capacity. <laughs> Councilman Carlson, some of the things you talked about, you know, um, working on a public records request, um, preparation for a deposition, assistance with responding to a subpoena, that wouldn't be covered by this. Now that being said, you know, we have an army of lawyers, you have Mr. Shelby, you know, typically we do assist council members when they ask for that kind of legal help as long as it relates to your work as a council person, but this, this ordinance wouldn't change the fact that um, we don't provide representation or pay for outside council for some of the things that you've talked about. And I know we made an exception on one item that was agreed to, but we that's just we that's not covered by this and that's not the type of representation that the case law and the statute would support. Could could I just say real fast, we it, my proposal on this, we've been back and forth for like a year or more, and my proposal on this was that we create a a fund where we put in fifty thousand dollars for each elected official, so that'd be four hundred thousand, including the mayor, and then um, and then we could automatically draw if it if it is counted like an insurance policy, then it is not does not exactly if it's set up in the right way doesn't exactly follow that rule she mentioned or law, and and then we would have up to fifty thousand protection right away, and then something like this would protect above that. Um, uh, Ms. Zellman, Marty, chief of staff, and I met. This agreement it is a compromise. Um, it's not what I wanted. I think it's not what they wanted, but it's better than what we have now. And so um, my suggestion is that we would approve this, and then if we want to try to get more protections in the future, then we work on that separately. And if I can add one thing, I apologize. Um, we d I did recently meet again with our risk management um, director um, about the possibility of the city purchasing legal defense insurance for the council members. It's not as, it's not as simple as one would think, um, but she is going to ask our brokers to look into that. However, 
the current errors and emissions policy that we have now, which has that $500,000 deductible, would be impacted. That <coughs> our current policy runs through April, and for reasons too involved to explain, it's it's it. It's not best practice to start asking them to be shopping for other insurance at this point in time. You, you typically want to wait until closer to when the that term has expired, is going to expire, so, or that policy, I should say. So she has agreed to shop that as we get closer to April, um, but she asks that we not try to you know, do that now. Um, if we were to if the city were to purchase that kind of insurance, then this ordinance would no longer be necessary. And it actually states something to that effect within this ordinance. Could I just, just clarify? Sorry, the, um, the, there, there are two different options we looked at. Um, one, the chief of staff recommended that where they would inter reimburse us individually for a, some kind of policy. And the other option is that we would buy insurance that I'm talking about a third option. In, in the case of the health insurance, uh, United Healthcare manages it, but the city, uh, so the city funds it. And so ultimately you're getting, you're getting made, you're getting the, the determination as to whether you get paid is from United, but the money that you're getting paid is from the city because we self insure it. And so my proposal, which is the third option is, is that somebody like that would run just like United does, somebody like that would run it, we would have a fund like $400,000. Somebody else would be paid to monitor it and make sure we follow the rules on who gets it reimbursed and how. And if we needed to, we could even pay a dollar a month for a premium or something like that. Anyway, we'll continue talking about those those issues, but for now, um, this is better than what we had. Council Member Hurtan. I just have a question. I'm, con I'm concerned about the, the, the small change that we had only because there's a statute of limitations for after we're out of office. So changing it from, I think you had current and former elected officials to simply elected officials, would that cover us for that? I think it's like a four or five year period after. So what Mr. Shelby and I talked about, the concern with that was that, that um, we had in our office was you know, people will file lawsuits, for example, beyond the expiration of a statute of limitations, and then you still have to file some sort of defensive pleading trying to get the case dismissed for, on the basis that the statute has already expired, and allowing every former elected official to come back to us and ask us to defend them for something that allegedly occurred while they were in office, we felt was, you know, too open-ended and, and mm -hmm. yeah but, but so what 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 he and I talked about yesterday is modifying the language to allow for it with some sort of time period like within yeah, the first two years after your term is over or the four, first four years or something like that yeah some I, reasonable yes yeah, so uh, like a statute of limitations what would that be for most things it, it really depends. Um, yeah, there's, there's two years for two years for tort and five years for let's say an ethics violation, something like that. Four years for contract. He I remember my Florida <laughs> statute ninety five eleven. It's now two years after March twenty first of two thousand twenty three for negligence. Uh, professional negligence is two years. I mean, what else is there? Well, there's five years for an ethics complaint, but the Florida see, yeah, no, that I don't know. I don't well, practice. Well, in you that see area. that that see my concern, and just as a point, just as a point of discussion, talking with Ms. Zellman, was that immediately after somebody leaves office, if somebody files an ethics complaint against them, or or another issue would be if somebody does file a cause of action for something that exceeds the statute of limitations, it'll be upon the former elected official to then be able to retain an attorney at their own expense to to file a response to that and respond. And, and the question would be, would that even be covered for reimbursement if they're no longer an elected official? If they came into the city and said, this was for something that took place while I was an elected official, I'd like to be, re be reimbursed. Is, is that even reimbursable after they leave office? Uh, but, but the idea is obviously, as, as Councilman Carlson said, this is a starting point. And yeah. I think it's great to have a starting point. I would just like to have something like that, uh, maybe, maybe 
between first and second reading, if we could just say, because those are Florida State rules, right? The statute of limitations, yeah. yes. So, so we could say statute of limitations for lawsuits based on Florida State rules, something like that. I don't know if that's too simplistic, um, but that way, if the rules change at the mm -hmm. state level, we don't have to change the mm -hmm. ordinance. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does, but I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm just thinking out loud. You know, there may be some causes of action that have longer periods of statute of limitations. But that's but, why I'm saying yeah, that's why well, if we can just if we, we just say the state. Yeah. So I, I just want to make sure that, like you said, it just doesn't come out two years later that there's an ethics complaint or whatever. So so, yes, uh, I will support the ordinance, but I would love between first and second reading just to have that change. Who would like to read this? Ordinance? And may I really fast? Yes, thank really you, sir. Fast. And and yeah, just really fast that that point on former elected officials is well taken. We have a duty, for example, to preserve public records um, uh, for however, however long it, we leave public office. I mean, it, again, there, there's a whole series of scenarios that can happen. I think this is something very good to combat what I would call the 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 culture of, of, of yeah. potential culture of lawsuits. Mm -hmm. uh, I I again I I. I as I said earlier today, I have my opinions on that, right? I, I really, really do. And as an attorney, I always try to not comment on things that are um, in, in litigation, et cetera. But, you know, um, that, that tool should trouble the hell out of all of us. And so this goes a long way in, um, in, in rebutting that. So I'm very supportive of that. And, you know, for me, in terms of council members or elected officials being covered, it's very simple. You're, if you're doing your actions in the course and scope of your uh, you know, capacity as an elected official, you, you arguably should be covered. But if I take my car right now and I rear end somebody uh, on, on a Saturday night and I'm not in the course and scope of my city council actions, they can sue me personally and I'll have to go to Geico, my insurance company, for, for coverage under my liability policy. So it's whether or not you're covered in the course and scope of employment, as, as, as I see it. Again, I'm not a government ethics lawyer or anything of that nature. So, so again, glad to support this. This is something that I think concerns all of us mm -hmm. tremendously. I mean, just tremendously. So I'm, you know, very glad to support this. Mr. Chairman, sir, if I can, just to take two more minutes, especially for the people at home, because this is not a self-serving thing. No. What you're doing, uh, it ha and it has a severe, it has a severe potential detrimental financial effect. But let me just read, so that people know at the outset, it's for the defense, and this is within the ordinance, the defense of such person against claims which arose out of and in connection with his or her performance of official duties and while serving a public purpose. And let me read a whereas clause so that people understand the importance of it. Whereas, I believe this is still in the current one, it's the first whereas clause. Whereas <laughs> it is the declared policy of the city of Tampa that there exists a municipal purpose to expend funds to provide for elected officials to perform their official duties while serving a public purpose without personal financial threat of legal action that may have a chilling effect upon the proper performance of their duties and the diligent representation of the public interest or might serve to dissuade capable and qualified individuals from entering public service. That's the purpose of this ordinance, is to serve the people, to help you better serve the people without what the Florida Supreme Court have called, the Supreme Court has called the chilling effect that a denial of representation might have on public officials in performing their duties properly and diligently. Then on that Thank note, you. Mr. Shelby, I'd like Councilman Hurtak to read this yes. and then add the, uh, the be between now and second reading what yeah. you were discussing. Okay. Great, file number E, 2023-8, chapter two, ordinance being presented for first reading consideration, an ordinance of the city of Tampa, Florida, amending city of Tampa code of ordinances, chapter two, administration, article, V5, I don't know how you want me to say that. <laughs> Article V, Finance Division 1, adding Section 2 234, authorizing the City of Tampa to provide for representation and reimbursement, including payment of associated costs of elected officials in the defense of civil litigation, claims, proceedings, actions, and ethics complaints arising out of or in connection with the performance of official duties while serving a public purpose 
authorizing the expenditure of city funds or insurance for such purpose in accordance with this section, authorizing the recovery of dispersed funds in the event the elected official is determined to be personally liable, repealing all ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict therewith, providing severability, providing an effective date, including the um, current and former elected officials authorization um, uh, in future between second read between first and second reading. Understood. Second, second, <laughs> second. Second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Second reading and adoption will be held on December seventh, twenty twenty three, at nine thirty a.m. Mr. Shelby. And just, just so that you know and the public knows, the changes will be made between first and second reading, and that is for an adoption public ordinance, uh, an adoption public hearing. It'll be a public hearing. All right, Mr. Shelby, it's new business time. I'll, I'll kick it off. I'm, I'll be brief. I have one motion. Uh, I'd like to make a motion for the USF student government to make a short presentation under five minutes on November 16th and introducing themselves to council. Motion by Chairman Miniscalco. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilman Hurtak. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, and then just a couple of things. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize that November is uh, National Diabetes Awareness Month. Um, I have members of my family that are affected. As you know, uh, several years ago I decided to eat healthy and lose weight and because I understand in my family, you know, the carbs, the sugar, and diabetes is, uh, you know, affects a lot of people. So, you know, um, I know it, it affects not just my family, a lot of friends. So I just want to bring that to uh, just make note of that. Also, a happy belated birthday to Councilmember Miranda, who's not here, but yesterday he celebrated his birthday, 38 backwards, as he likes to say. And uh, just a reminder that today, the last new Beatles song was released. Wow. I know. 61 years after their first single. Did you really hear it? I listened to it. It's, it's, a, it's an old tape of John Lennon, a recording that he made in the 70s, so they used AI to clean it up. Mm. And then, of course, uh, George Harrison passed away in 2001. They, they started working on it, recording it, and I think they used that. So all the Beatles are on it. I don't know if Ringo sings, but you can, you can hear the voices. So just very interesting what technology does. With There's a making up video that I watched last yeah, night. It was it's like four, 14, 15 minutes long. So being a big Beatles fan, although the Rolling Stones are my favorite, I just wanted to acknowledge my second favorite band, the Beatles. Councilman Carlson, do you have any no, new business? You. Councilwoman Hurtak. Yes, I do. Uh-oh. Um, here, and I'm giving three, so one for Mr. Shelby and one for the court. Uh, yes. 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 Uh, yeah, I have one for Clinton and one for, um, uh, for Mr. Miranda. Uh, I had a meeting with Mr. Biday and the mobility team on Tuesday and was told that all counselors, council members had received the draft mobility framework study that was completed in August. The study states that, quote, the current fee has not been updated or adjusted since it was adopted in 1989. I think I was in middle school. Um, as shown in table one, which Ms. Sharp is gonna show, <laughs> uh, which, and which I passed out to you all, uh, the mobility fee paid by development within the city of Tampa is lower than anywhere else by, in the region by a good chunk and is one of the lowest mobility fees charged in the state. <clears throat> According to Administrator Duncan, this study was done to analyze optimal approaches to take when we initiate, initiate a mobility multimodal impact fee study. The community, the community was overwhelmingly against raising the millage rate, but we learned a lot during that process and we need to look at fees charged by the city that have not kept up with cost and that the community really wants developers to pay their fair share. That is what we heard very clearly. So I have a motion to have mobility staff come back on November 16th, 2023 with the next steps to move forward with a mobility multimodal impact fee study. Yes. We have a great, great motion by Councilman Hurtak. We have a second from Councilman Hurt, uh, Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh -oh. And then, oh. So quickly, what, 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 yes. it's going to be a, basically the same memo that you yeah. got on public mm -hmm. service the, impact fees. But, but that is what the mobility department asked. They said sure. they wanted those two weeks and that we could go forward then. Right. But I wanted the um, council to have the, the time. Sure. And then, then, now, I have big, big personal Such news. A teacher. Okay. 
zoom out a little bit. Uh, as you all may know, I am a, uh, uh, my husband and I have been fosters for Tampa Bay Beagle Rescue for many years, and this is our 21st foster. Her name is Angelica, but we like to call her Jelly, and uh, we officially adopted her two weeks ago. So, uh, um, yes, it is our first foster failure. Um, our, our previous dog was a, um, we like to call her a, um, she was a doggy therapist. She was a doggy social worker, and she really helped 20 other dogs find their homes. And Jelly's going to, uh, she is on her way to becoming um, our, next, our next doggy social worker to help uh, hopefully 20 more other dogs find their homes. So I just wanted, you know, personal news. So very excited and uh, happy to uh, have her in our family. And we adopted her through Tampa Bay Beagle Rescue. Just wanted to sh throw a shout out that if there's a dog, a type of dog you're looking for, there's a rescue in the area that will help you find it. Um, if not, of course, we have um, shelters that are uh, wonderful places as well. But um, yeah, so congratulations, Miss Jelly. That's wonderful news. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm a Jackson 5 kind of girl, by the way. Yeah. Hey, I mean, who just, doesn't, who doesn't yeah, like Michael Jackson? Who doesn't you know, like Just Michael Jackson? dating myself. And in 1989, yeah, these, this data here, 1989, I was pregnant with Ariel, so that was 33 years ago, y'all. I was starting these fees. Oh, God. <laughs> Be quiet, boy. <laughs> Be quiet. Okay. Um, I have two motions here. I would like to... Um, move that the city legal and administrative staff draft an ordinance requiring all persons or entities that enter into multi-phase or multi-year development agreements with the city of Tampa be required to file an annual monitoring report in connection with that agreement identifying all conditions and requir requirements contained in that agreement applicable to the developer and whether the developer has complied with those conditions and requirements. Further, the ordinance should require and identify a process for staff to review the monitoring reports and the status of all development agreements annually and to provide for notice to the developer of any required corrective actions and or penalties if one or more material violations of any of the development agreement conditions or requirements are discovered. I am requesting the draft ordinance to, to be provided to City Council at City Council's January 11th regular meeting. We have a motion. Do we have a second? <laughs> we have a second from Thank Councilwoman Hertak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the second one is um, that I move that the Citizens Budget Advisory Committee present at least two to three options of a salary increase for city council working with staff to determine recommendations and timeline, timelines within this fiscal year, looking particularly at any funds not expended in last fiscal year. Second. We have a motion from Councilwoman Henderson, second from Councilwoman Hertak, and Mr. Shelby and, with a. Oh, yes, and that can come back. Uh, I would like to get that information by Christmas. So what date would that be? Well, I will, I will tell December 21st. December 21st, if yes. If I can, Council, if I may, let me just take a look at the calendar. They are not meeting in November. Their next meeting is scheduled for December 8th. And if it's Council's, oh, pleasure, yeah. if it's council's pleasure, I will add. I will ask that that be added to their next agenda. Thank you, and Attorney Shelby. And if I may, I'll, I'll, if I may I'll, I'll vote for this. This doesn't have any distinction on dates or anything of that nature. Fine with that. That's just uh, thank you. Okay, and the last thing I would like to say. We need to okay. vote on it. We oh yeah, we didn't vote. Motion from Sorry. Councilwoman Henderson. Do we have a second? I did. Yeah. Second from Councilwoman Hertak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm gonna oppose it. Yes. I'm not kidding. Yeah, I'm a no. I'm a no. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Yes, ma'am. You have another motion? Yes. No, not a motion. Just an announcement <laughs> that a dragon, a Jefferson dragon over in another chamber was appointed the superintendent of Hillsborough County Public Schools. He is my birthday brother, October 5th. Oh. Van Ayers unanimously was elected the superintendent of Hillsborough County Public Schools. So congratulations to him. We are very fortunate to have him. So 
a Jefferson Dragon is the superintendent of Hillsborough County Public and Schools. And former principal and UT guy, right? Yeah. And University of Tampa grad as well, yes. And a super nice guy. Yeah, yeah if you haven't gotten to know him, Van Ayers well, is great. If he's really nice, he might have to toughen up a little bit, but yeah. in that job. He's, but. he's good. He's going to do a good job. He's, he's going to do a great job. Council Member Vieira. Speaking of nice guys, I'm making a motion on the nicest man in the city of Tampa. Um, Officer Roy Paz, a lot of y'all know him. He's, he I is, couldn't agree more. He is a six foot three, Mr. Rogers. I love the guy. He's the nicest guy in the world. So I, I'm, I'm motioning, actually, it's something for his late father. Um, I motion for the multi sports field to be rain, named after the late Roland Paz Sr., uh, the father of famed, wonderful temp, uh, Tampa Police Department officer Roy Paz. Uh, Roland Paz Sr. started the Forest Hills soccer league and was a big advocate for improvements to the Forest Hills Recreation Center, especially the multi-purpose field. He passed away in August of 1977 when his son was very, very young, but he had a deep, deep influence in the community, the Forest Hills Soccer League, the field itself, and especially his wonderful son, who is just, again, not nicest guy you'll ever find. So I motioned for that to come back. Um, let's do the second week or third week in January of 2024. There you go, yeah. if I may. I will, I will say this. I'm a nice guy. Yeah. Councilman Vieira is a really nice guy. But the nicest guy I've ever met is Roy Paz. He makes Camp us Police look Park. like Putin. In he got off show the month here one time a couple years ago. You, you were here. Yeah. And you just have to, if you can pull it up, you got to watch it. I love him. There were a bunch of people in the audience, and he thought they were here for, they were, it was random that he was here for them whatever, that they were here for him, yeah. and he's just thanking everybody, and when the, the gifts get brought up, and he was like a kid at Christmas. Oh, I love the nicest guys. guy ever, and he looks like a movie star. I think that's what my yeah, mom he said. does. Is this like, guy an actor? And I go, so. Right, Errol Flynn meets Gary Cooper. Exactly. Right. So wow. we have a motion from, a oh yeah, he's, he's really cool. Councilman uh, Vieira with the motion, Senator Councilwoman Henderson, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And January 25th. 25th? Yes. 21st. Yeah, oh, it's January. 11 plus 4, yeah, 27. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, oh, uh, go ahead. No, 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 go, go ahead. Did you have one more? Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, if yeah, I may, go. just really quick. I was asked by my friends, our friends at the Tampa Hispanic Bar Association to give them a council commendation at their gala November 15th, I think it is. We have uh, so I make a motion for that Six. offside. Second, Councilwoman Hertek, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Yes, ma'am? I... I I, I feel like I'm channeling uh, Councilman Miranda, which I knew he would do this. If So I feel like we need to do it for him and I'll, we'll let him, him do it. But we need to uh, do a commendation to Mr. Spearman for all of his phenomenal years and yes. hard work and that he's provided to the city, especially the extra two years he stayed on when we didn't have anyone. So I would like to do that December 7th. Um, if he's available. If not, we can change the date. Or until the 21st. Yeah, yeah. We'll, let, we'll work. We're going to put 7th as the ten tentative, yes. and then we'll make sure that he's either still around, but if he's retired, he might be on a big trip or something. We'll just make it happen. But we'll figure it out. I'll say the 7th of December. Councilwoman Hertek with the motion. Second from? Second. Councilwoman Henderson, all in favor? Aye. 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 And that's it. May I have a motion to receive and file? Motion so moved. Wait, Mr. Shelby, you have something else? Oh, no, I... <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what I would do without this Sweet. phenomenal deputy clerk. I don't know what I would do. This is this is a, a resolution ratifying, confirming the appointment of Taryn Kramer as a member of the civil service board that you previously passed. So I'd like you to be able to move it to ratify it so it's official. And may I say, wonderful person, wonderful family. Same. I've known her since high school and uh, Great addition. Councilwoman Hertek with the motion, seconded Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? One last thing, Council, and I, I guess I'll send it out as a memo to remind you and your legislative aides that if it's the will of Council, I know we're missing two members, to want to discuss um, the work that we're doing to try to make your meetings run better and run shorter and have a special discussion meeting for that regard, maybe we could have your aides check the calendar and see what works for you. It wouldn't be a long meeting, and we'll try to make it as streamlined as possible. Okay. Motion to receive and file. I'm sorry. Yeah, to receive and file from Councilwoman Henderson. Second from? Vieira. Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Yeah. I only have something to do in the next uh, 50.